Jimmy Ong, EY's Asia Pacific blockchain leader, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to EY's 2022 APEC virtual meetup. This past year, we have seen the rise of blockchain through non-fungible tokens or NFTs, the metaverse, and various forms of digital assets. It's been used for music and the arts, creation of new asset classes, and evolving in as, in, in as many ways as the creative and innovative mind can make it. Today is my great pleasure to have a group of speakers and panelists who are not only specialists in their own industries and sectors, but are experts at how blockchain is being applied today in their respective sectors. Starting off, we have Adam Gerard, who will be hosting a panel from CoinHeco, Syngenum, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore to talk about the progress of digital assets. Following that, Mark Whiteman will be expanding on the future of digital assets with a panel from ADDX, HSBC, and Coinbase. In the afternoon, we are joined by Roy Liu and our friends from Kuosheng Securities and BSN to discuss on central bank digital currencies. Magnus, Magnus Jones will follow right after that with a tech talk on the metaverse with Centauri 5, Jubils, and the Norwegian business entity registers. We will then have Rick Ross hosting Power Ledger, Curtin University, and agri-digital touching on ESG mass adoption, and that's environment, social, and governance. Finally, Scott and Federico will wrap things up for us with a presentation and demo on redefining supply chain. So a, a, a quite a wide, long list of, of uh, agenda coming up ahead. I hope that everyone will enjoy this session and be able to make the most out of it through the interaction on the on the chat and uh, questions as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over this time to Paul Brody, our global blockchain leader, to give our keynote address. Paul, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Brody. I am the global blockchain leader here at EY. And even though this is a virtual summit, I'm actually in person in Singapore, and I'm I'm here for a couple of days and then I'm going to go off to Australia. So it's really nice to be in Asia Pacific. Um, I have some slides to share with you today to talk about the future of blockchain. And uh, if, uh, if the host, uh, Wasim, would kindly enable screen sharing, I will share my slides with everybody. Uh, and you will also be able to pick these up on the, um, the EY website afterwards. And you can actually see a slightly more complete version of this presentation on our YouTube channel. So uh, with that, let me see if I'm allowed to share my screen. I am, very nice, thank you, sir. Uh, all righty, so um, as I said, uh, the market has changed and, and the point of my talk today and, and my goal really is to talk about how the, the market for blockchain and crypto has changed and why it's good to think about 2022 as the end of the beginning. And what I really mean by that is that, you know, markets go through phases as they develop, right? They, uh, they take on different forms and we have ended one of the formative portions of the era of blockchain. We are entering into a new one now that's really, really exciting, but we need to understand that the market has changed. And so the rules in this market have also changed. Now, uh, just, I wanna start by sharing with you how I think about uh, uh, markets. And this is not just blockchain, this is all kinds of technology ecosystems. They tend to go through five distinct phases. There's a, an explosion of early adoption where people understand the technology and they grasp its potential and they get very excited about it, right? That's typical. And there's this kind of surge of adoption and then people get into it and they're like, whoa, this is harder than I thought, right? And, and that's where you hit what Gartner often calls the trough of disillusionment. This is a difficult period where people still understand the vision and the value proposition, but they're struggling with the implementation. And at a certain point, not necessarily guaranteed any particular time, you get to the inflection point. And the inflection point is this point where somebody has figured out a value proposition, which is compelling, and that triggers a shift towards mainstream adoption. And mainstream adoption in the enterprise space can be anywhere from 10 to 15 years of really sustained growth where people join the network, they add value to the network, and they start discovering new use cases, 
And then finally, you get into the late adopting phase. And for example, in cloud, we're really about in a late adopter phase. Now, we still have clients who are moving to the cloud, but the vast majority of the world's companies have moved to the cloud or are moving their um, implementations or have done so already. So this is where we are. The blockchain ecosystem has moved into that environment. And in particular, there's three things that have sort of hit this inflection point. Cryptocurrencies and NFTs, right? Those are rapidly approaching really saturation. I, I've seen statistics that say, for example, in the US and Europe, somewhere between 15 and 25% of the population own crypto assets or NFTs today. That's far from saturation, but it's certainly what that means is it's achieved kind of widespread adoption. And three or four years from now, that's likely to be that as many people who want them have them. Decentralized finance and decentralized autonomous organizations uh, are both ramping up very, very rapidly. DeFi has gotten quite large and DAOs are really just starting to, to surge in their adoption. So these three use cases are driving this transition from early adopter to mainstream adoption. And in this environment, we see what looks and feels like a very crowded ecosystem, right? We've got all these different platforms and, and people ask me all the time, how do you tell the difference, right? Ethereum, Ripple, Solana, Cardano, how do I understand what to use? And the answer is, even though the space is quite crowded, if you step back and you look at it, you know, very objectively, if you switch from a, um, a logarithmic view to an absolute view, what you can see is that actually the market has chosen. It has chosen Ethereum. Now, there are many, many other platforms out there and they have lots of little bits of share, but um, the market has chosen Ethereum. It is the dominant platform. And we believe we are far enough along that this is unlikely to change. And, and a good historical analogy, this is a pattern that you see all the time, right? A platform achieves a certain level of dominance. It becomes a platform of choice, but it's far from perfect. This was true with PCs. It was true with mobile devices. And as that happens, you still, you still see people launching new platforms. And these new platforms have really cool features that, that outperform the original, but ultimately they don't succeed because these new platforms are in some ways confusing efficiency. They can do transactions better and cheaper with effectiveness, which is the Ethereum is a good example. It's got some shortcomings in terms of gas fees and scalability that are being resolved, but it's also got the marketplace. It's got the capital, it's got the users and the customers, right? 95% of all NFTs, 70% of all DeFi, uh, at a minimum, at least three times more developers than any other platform that is dominant. And it, it's very typical. If you look at this same thing is what it looked like in the PC business. People were still launching new platforms long after it was fairly clear that the PC was becoming the dominant platform. And again, if you switch from this log scale, which shows you kind of all the different platforms that were still launching and growing to an absolute picture, you see that fairly quickly the PC became dominant. Uh, and, and then uh, even though others continue to grow, the reality is that platform was chosen. And by the way, here we are 30 years later, it's still the dominant computing platform. And I, I would go venture so far as to say, I think we have reached that point with Ethereum. It has won the kind of layer one platform battles. And I won't be surprised if 30 years from now, we are still primarily using Ethereum as our blockchain mainnet. Ethereum is maturing very nicely. It's maturing in terms of scalability in layer two networks. It's also demonstrating something really important, which is institutional maturity, right? About every three months, Ethereum has had a hard fork these forks have been planned, they've been organized, they are built according to some very boring committees that spend lots of time thinking about things like scalability and reliability. That every three months pattern is just an indicator of maturity. What we see again right now is the merge, the merge of uh, the proof of stake network with the legacy uh, proof of work network. That's scheduled for later this year. I expect it to happen. That will really be kind of the arrival that will herald the arrival of what used to be called Ethereum 2.0. So it's got maturity, it's got momentum and the layer two ecosystem that's taking shape on top of Ethereum is providing a lot of the scalability needed to keep growing the network. So the market has changed. We're in a period of mainstream adoption. We have a chosen platform. What are the new rules of this ecosystem? I would say first and foremost, we are now from moving from which platform should I work on to what are the use cases, 
And the evolution of use cases is true, is something that happens in every single uh, computing ecosystem, whether it was PCs or uh, mobile devices or the internet, what happens is you start with a few use cases, email, web browsing, and you gradually sort of stack new ones on top of them, data storage, e-commerce, media delivery, uh, web conferencing. The same thing is gonna be true with blockchain. We started with cryptocurrencies, we started adding digital assets, we went into NFTs, we're adding DAOs, we're adding DeFi, the use cases are going to keep stacking on top of each other. Indeed, at a certain point, what happens is the, the network becomes more important than the use case in the sense that um, a use case might not be ideal for blockchain, but you would want to deploy it on blockchain, not because blockchains are ideal for this use case, but, use case, but because in a blockchain, you have hundreds of millions of customers with hundreds of billions of dollars in assets who want to buy assets and products and services in this ecosystem. They've got wallets, they've got money, they're a market, so you want to sell to them. Now, evolution of blockchain services, I believe, will look a lot like the internet, but it will be faster. And the model, I think, that we can expect to see is already starting to replicate itself. So if you go back to the early days of the internet, we had a bunch of digital building blocks, mobile data, GPS, smartphones, credit cards, APIs, and people started at first by just building on the internet stuff that they did off the internet. You know, online shopping was like a catalog where you didn't have paper and it was kind of dull, right? We had maps and directions um, and things like that. But eventually people started stacking in innovations on top of each other. It wasn't a huge leap from maps and directions to ride hailing, for example, or online shopping and social networks to uh, influencer fueled crowdfunded businesses. But nonetheless, they were genuine innovations. And eventually, we go from stuff that I think of as predictable but pretty cool to really innovative to almost hard to predict or just bizarre. One of my favorite examples are restaurants that are kind of fueled by celebrity influencers and they are run entirely through outsourced decentralized infrastructure so that this restaurant that you're buying from doesn't actually have any restaurant locations at all. We'll see the same thing. I feel like we're starting to see that with DeFi. We had very predictable stuff going on early on, deposit contracts, lending contracts, and we're gradually heading towards more accelerating disruptions like yield farming and smart contract insurance and, and other digital services. I can't predict what those are gonna be, except for to say that, that we seem to be going through a similar pattern of in innovation from predictable results to accelerating disruptions. In terms of our own short-term forecast, we have spent some time thinking about where the market is going over the next few years. As I mentioned before, cryptocurrencies and NFTs, we are approaching what I would call late stage market saturation over the next few years. We are still in the early eras of DeFi and stable coins. Supply chain traceability is, is maturing very, very rapidly, but we're really just starting to scratch the surface on business contracts and payments or supply chain operations. So supply chain operations today are very focused on things like inventory management. You can't do those on the blockchain in the past because of privacy restrictions. Now that privacy tools are maturing, we expect to start seeing companies do procurement, inventory management, asset management on public blockchains. So we expect to see, these are at least fall into the category of predictable things that are emerging or maturing or scaling now, and we expect to see ramp over the next few years. Now, one of the ones that I'm most excited about is supply chain traceability with operational data. So historically, it's always been possible to track in a very elegant way how things mature on a blockchain. So you can, you can look at tokenization for assets, you can combine different tokens into a finished product and move it along the network. But historically, Although you could do traceability, so you could show somebody, hey, where did this product come from? You wouldn't want to do operational things because you didn't have privacy. Now with privacy, however, we can do things like create one token, not just for each batch, but for each product or each product set or each shipment. And then because we can manage those tokens under private ecosystem, private data model, 
on a public blockchain, I can now do things like manage my inventory across a multi-company supply chain and one that uh, retains visibility to the partners who are allowed to see it runs on a public blockchain, but doesn't provide visibility to people outside the network because of the privacy tools that are being deployed on chain. We're going to be launching uh, this in a few months, and we're going to do so using a combination of off-chain data storage and zero knowledge proofs. And I'll come back to the zero knowledge side a little bit later. But this is one is super exciting for me. I think it's, it's a big step forward. The other one that's a really big step forward right now is over in the regulatory environment. So this year, whether it's in the US or in other countries, the US is, is moving particularly fast and, and, and I think in a positive way, we're gonna see a lot more regulatory clarity around stable coins and central bank digital currencies. Now, CBDCs are ramping up, they're gaining a lot of momentum. I personally think where we are most likely to end up is in a global ecosystem of regulated stable coins outside of China. I will specifically exclude China because the market is quite different there. And we have a, a talk coming up later this morning about specifically the CBDC rules in China. But I think in the rest of the world, we will for sure end up with an ecosystem that's primarily regulated stable coins, right? And, and this will be done by central banks because they don't want to compete with their business partners, which are the retail banks. And they also don't want to create a situation where um, there is a single centrally run digital coin that could have a software flaw. In this model, you could have many, many different stable coins and they would each have some level of differentiation, which reduces the risk of any one massive systematic digital risk in the financial ecosystem. CBDC pilots are nonetheless going ahead. I think for the most part, they're likely to be disappointing. There's 41 uh, uh, research projects going on, 14 pilots involved, nine CBDCs have been launched. Um, generally speaking, the CBDCs that are out there so far are centrally managed. They don't have privacy guarantees. And most importantly, they're not programmable. There isn't a single central bank digital currency out there that you can put on a public blockchain and use to buy a crypto punk or an NFT or, a, uh, or put into a DeFi contract. And as a consequence of that, at least for existing blockchain users who are out there using stable coins, none of these CBDCs hold any promise of replacing the stable coins that they use today. Now, I think central banks are absolutely understand that I've talked with central bankers, they are aware of these challenges and they are thinking through some of the choices they have, but I know that regulated stable coins are likely to be one of the choices that many countries settle on as a way to scale this and to manage the very large usage of these stable coins that's already taking place. Now, let me finish up and let's talk a little bit about, okay, how do you play in this market and what will the future look like? Let's start with the how to play in this market because uh, it's great to have new market. What do we think the rules are, right? I would say the most important thing to remember, there just is no compression algorithm for experience. This is something they say over at Amazon, and I think it's genius and it's true. And, and, and I, the reason I think it's genius and it's true is because we at EY keep learning from the school of hard knocks, right? We have been in this business working on public blockchains for seven years now. It's hard work. And you know, everything I feel like every year we are like two years behind where I want it to be, right? That's because, you know, we keep going forward and stepping on kind of new difficulties. But I also really believe that it's not that we're especially stupid. <laughs> At least I'd like not to think so. It's because it's hard building out new infrastructure. And the only way that you learn how to do this stuff is to actually do it. There is no, there are no amount of white papers that can prepare you for the challenge of doing this. So if you believe blockchain is in your business future, you must get your fingers in there and do it on public blockchains, right? You have to go and participate in the open competitive ecosystem. Private blockchains are no substitute for the experience you will get dealing with public ecosystems, with complexity, with supply chain challenges. There's no substitute. Three kind of clear recommendations I would give. Number one, stop trying to find the right platform, just start building on Ethereum. Number two, stop benchmarking your legacy competition. 
if you are going to benchmark anybody, it needs to be a blockchain native or a crypto native company, right? If you are benching, benchmarking some large US bank or a large European bank or something like that, you are benchmarking the wrong benchmark. And then lastly, I think things have shifted. The risk of not doing something is now bigger than the risk of doing something and getting it wrong. What is EY doing? We've got five key product and service offerings, right? Three of them are what I would call the usual suspects, assurance, consulting, and, and tax, right? We do the assurance work, financial statement audits. We do the consulting. We do software implementation, tax, and tax advice. All of them are underpinned by something that is somewhat unusual, 100% of the transactions, right? Um, the second thing is we're building our own applications in the Ethereum ecosystem and very importantly, we also do research. Uh, research is, is a huge investment that we make, and we do this because it's really important to understand cryptography. If you're going to build applications and sign off on audits in an ecosystem that's built on mapping cryptography, you got to have cryptographers, you've got to understand the mechanics. And then we believe, especially, that for enterprise users, nothing is more important than privacy. Right, uh, and I don't mean privacy for the purpose of, of conducting illicit transactions. I mean privacy from your competition. And actually blockchain offers this incredibly elegant opportunity to have privacy from your competition, transparency with your business partners and provability of compliance to regulators. So I think there's a, a, a huge kind of growth opportunity in here for enterprises. I personally believe that the future of how businesses interact with each other is entirely based on blockchain technology. We have consolidated over the last three years, a lot of our technology into a single platform. You can find it at blockchain.ey.com. And we've got really two sets of applications. One is called OpsChain. That's for businesses to do business on the blockchain, implement contracts, manage product traceability, manage uh, digital assets and finances. And then Blockchain Analyzer, which is all about understanding your business transactions, reconciling your on-chain and off-chain transactions, security testing your smart contracts. All of these things are accessible in a single ecosystem. And we're gonna be adding a lot of applications this year now that we've migrated all of our products into this ecosystem. And I, I'm really proud that is of all the kind of big transitions we have made over the last few years, moving all of these services into a single infrastructure has been incredibly powerful. We've delivered a lot of capability. One thing that, that's a really cool proof point of how, how far we've matured is that over the New Year's holiday and the Chinese New Year, we delivered 8,000 NFTs, 8,000 New Year's greetings to our clients around the world. The entire thing was done from idea to execution in under three weeks. That included having an internal art competition, designing a, a, a non-crypto expert interface so that people could easily log in. And if you didn't have a crypto wallet, we would create one for you. We implemented security best practices and the whole thing cost us less than postage. We executed everything on the, uh, on the uh, Polygon network, which is a layer two scaling network on top of Ethereum. So just a little example of some of the things that we can do. Another thing that we are doing that I think is, is even more exciting is we are working with Polygon to create a special purpose privacy oriented network called Polygon Nightfall. And this is a layer two network. It sits on top of Ethereum and it's built on technology that EAY developed around blockchain privacy. And, and it allows you to take any kind of major blockchain token, a fungible token or a non-fungible token and transfer it to other business partners with full privacy. You can have a provable transaction history for audits. There are gonna be multiple validators and we're gonna have industry leading transaction costs for private transactions. It's running now already, it's live on the Ethereum testnet and we expect to go to production over the next few months. We have just finished a whole bunch of extensive testing. But we've been working on this for like, five years in terms of how to make privacy work. And we're now really seeing implementation at scale. And it's the engine based on zero knowledge proofs that will allow us to do things like have inventory management with privacy on the public blockchain. I wanna finish up 
with just a last thought about thinking ahead. Because one of the things that people have a hard time thinking about is what does exponential growth look like? Historically, exponential growth, mainstream adoption phase in a large industry like network equipment or cloud computing means around 25 to 30% a year growth for something on the order of 15 to 20 years. That's enormous growth. And when you think about that, what that means is that a blockchain ecosystem today that's $3 trillion is 108 trillion in 2037. And there's a lot of people who would look at that number and say, that's crazy. But that's not crazy because it would just be repeating what happened to network equipment, cloud computing, or mobile devices. This is not crazy. These are not crazy numbers. So think about how big this can be. And then think about one other thing, which is that the companies that entered and led these markets in the early stages are still the dominant players 20, 30, 40, 70 years later, right? And this, by the way, is not just a pattern from the tech industry. This is true in automotive. It was true in steel. It was true in railways, right? Getting to the front of these markets early on assures you a, a leadership position in that use case for decades. And I typically think when I talk to our clients, they do not understand that the market they are talking about is decades of market leadership and profits, not a year or two. And that being late by a year or two means giving up hundreds of billions in revenue potentially and hundreds of billions in profits and market value. That sounds crazy, but it's really just history repeating itself. And we human beings are just not naturally good at thinking about how do you manage um, a, a product growth at exponential scale. So that's all I've got for you today. It's been a delight talking to you. Come visit us at blockchain.ey.com. Mark your calendars, May 17 to 20. We're gonna have our global blockchain summit in New York. We'll also stream it live. Major product announcements coming. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit. I'm gonna hand it back to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Up next, we have Adam, Adam Gerard, and the panel is coming up. So Adam, over to you, please. Thanks, Jimmy, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam, and I'm a partner at EY and our Asia-Pacific blockchain leader for our assurance services. So the topic for this panel is the progress of digital assets. The digital assets ecosystem has developed at pace over the last couple of years. And you know, it, it used to be seen as a as a little bit of a unregulated wild west that was that was focused on uh, uh, transactions with with consumers. But now, what we're seeing is that it's it's become a lot more institutionalized, um, including regulations uh, and and bigger businesses uh, you know, starting to participate. We've got different types of exchange now and different types of products. Um, so you know, at, at the beginning. It started off with essentially Bitcoin um, and the other, some of the other cryptocurrencies. Now the ecosystem is much wider. So we have you know, all the altcoins, tokenized securities, and also moving to, to business to business transactions um, to support wealth management and, and other market participants. So how did we get here uh, and why? So with me today, I am excited to have three key industry participants. Uh, Damien Pang, who is the Deputy Chief Fintech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, he has responsibility for the fintech ecosystem development and also uh, data and technology architecture. Yu Xiu Liu is the co-founder and CEO of CoinHacko. Uh, he's a pioneer in digital assets and he co-founded CoinHacko in 2014 when Bitcoin was still in its infancy. And then thirdly, we have Gerald Go. Uh, Gerald is the co-founder and CEO of Signum in Singapore. And uh, prior to that, he's worked in alternative investments and also investment consulting. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. So I'd like to kick off the session by exploring this from the angle of consumer behaviors and how they've evolved over the years, how we've got to where we are now. So what are, what are customers demanding? Uh, how is the industry responding and evolving uh, to that? So firstly, Yushu, could I turn to you first uh, to give us your thoughts on, on this piece? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adam. Uh, th thanks for having having me here. So, uh, yeah, let's let's just talk about uh, you know customers first, right? Uh, you know, first, uh, CoinHako mostly offers digital currencies uh, such as Bitcoin, ETH, and many of the top market coins uh, to extend stable coins. Uh, but you know, today what we are seeing is, is a huge uh, customer base of millennial consumers, uh, which have you know global attitude and behavior. And, and today, I think most of them are looking at crypto as a form of investment versus using it as a form of payment. Uh, but although you know the past uh, twelve to twenty-four months, we've been seeing a, a slight increase in uh, people using crypto as a form of payment. Um, I. Beyond that, you know, we're seeing, we're noticing uh, uh, more women investing in the space. Um, engagement with crypto is inversely proportional uh, with the age. Um, and, and yeah, beyond that, generally, uh, we are seeing a lot of long-term holders, you know, passive owners uh, in, in our, on our platform. But, you know, this could also be a platform behavior because, uh, you know, our fee structure and we are not really in an exchange. Uh, but I think more importantly, in you know, the past six months, we've observed a spike in uh, NFT demand and purchase, right? Uh, you know, in this COVID world, uh, you know, customers are also evolving uh, rapidly. You know, there, there's huge opportunities as, uh, you know, not just customers, consumers, uh, but also as a creator as well as innovators. Uh, I think the, the, the key takeaway is that, you know, the triggers are also evolving, right? Uh, Crypto is no longer just about investments not about buying low selling high uh, but instead it's about you know getting involved uh, engaging with your favorite uh, artists or supporting the works of your your uh, content creators or even participating in games so that you can purchase items right um, so I think yeah that, that's a you know, quick overview on the, the, the consumer behavior I think uh, Gerald can touch a bit more on the, the insti side Cool. Thanks for queuing me in, Yushu, and uh, thank you, Adam, for having me uh, at the forum today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit more about uh, Signum as well as our view on the fast-evolving crypto and digital asset ecosystem. Uh, just a little bit uh, of a clarification. Um, I represent here uh, Signum in Singapore. Um, Signum as a group, as some of you may be aware, uh, we are we're we're truly the world's first fully regulated digital asset fintech platform operating at the nexus of both Switzerland and Singapore. And um, I mentioned those two ge geographies because uh, the license types that we hold in both markets uh, do vary. In Switzerland, we are regulated as a universal bank as well as a securities dealer. Uh, and it's from that market that we have the most extensive range of products and services that we can offer to clients. In Singapore, we are currently regulated as an asset manager, but um, you might have seen the news, Adam. Um, uh, we were very privileged uh, a few days ago to announce that the MES has also provided Signum in principle approval for three additional regulated activities under the CMS, namely custodial services uh, for capital market product, corporate finance advisory, as well as uh, a dealing in capital market product um, uh, license. And so, um, collectively, we are increasingly going to be able to offer the full suite of Signum's offering directly to Singaporean clients as well. Um, one of the reasons my, uh, well, one of the key reasons my co-founders and I um, incorporated Signum and launched the company four years ago now uh, was the recognition that uh, while the crypto markets, crypto as a, an asset class was very fine-tuned for the retail investor, folks that were managing their own personal accounts. Um, you know, in 2017, when we, when we came together to ideate Signum, it was very apparent uh, because of our professional experience as uh, capital allocators you know, um, in the or, or folks in the regulatory space that uh, the, the market was not um, fit for purpose whenever you had a principal agent set up whenever you were managing fiduciary monies um, because again it was a uh, for most of the first decade plus of its existence crypto um, was a grassroots retail led opportunity so signum was set up specifically to address the pain points of institutions corporates 
and accredited investors to on-ramp into crypto. Um, and um, consequently, the first um, things that we did as, as a firm were to establish ourselves in trusted um, leading financial hubs, Switzerland and Singapore. The next thing we did was to obtain uh, the necessary licenses to operate. And we've never had any products or services out into the market um, until we received first the regulatory nod to do so. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate uh, that um, the, the, the way the market has developed, that um, the licenses that we possess and the target audiences that we serve, institutional investors, corporates, and high net worth, I think that segment of the market is finally now being activated and uh, coming uh, to, and learning a, a lot about you know, the, the, the exciting innovation uh, the digital assets uh, bring to the table and uh, the importance of incorporating crypto as part of a diversified portfolio of traditional investments. So um, I think just in the interest of time, just, uh, with regards to the institutional adoption of crypto, which is something that we've been, um, again, set up to do from day one, we're seeing a lot more evidence of that happening you know, day by day. We now serve over a thousand clients as a group, um, and these are some of the largest uh, foundations, crypto foundations out there, also some of the largest family offices in our uh, various markets. Um, and uh, uh, certainly uh, the pipeline of institutional clients that are onboarding with us has never abated since we opened our doors uh, to clients in January 2020. So um, we're seeing a lot more activity, a lot more activation, and, 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 and also the share of wallet has increased. So the last uh, factoid I'll leave you with, I know we'll come back to this uh, point about adoption later on as well, Adam. Um, if I look at our, from the bank's perspective, the average amount of assets that a high net worth individual, uh, of, a client of Signum um, was holding on their Signum account in December 31st, 2020, that um, was something in the region of 50 to 60,000 Swiss francs. Fast forward to 31st December 2021, as we did our analysis um, from you know, the last financial year, and uh, that same calculation um, you know, generates a, a number closer to 1.1 million francs. So suddenly we're not talking about play money anymore. Suddenly we're not talking about sandbox uh, you know, experimentation. Suddenly we're talking about real money, real values, um, I think which reflects, again, the growing institutional comfort and uh, in, uh, interest um, with, with crypto assets uh, and, and you know, making um, larger, more significant investments uh, in the asset class. we we'll pause there, Adam. And, uh, yeah. thanks, thanks, Gerald, and, and you sure really appreciate those, those insights. And, and Gerald, just to pick up on one of the, the things that you mentioned there around the, the size of, the typical size of uh, institutional investments, um, is, is, is there also any change in terms of the, the nature of the client base with regards to size of the corporates, uh, nature of activities? Because um, I think that's, that's, that's something that we're seeing uh, a little bit. Yeah, thank, uh, appreciate that question, Adam. I definitely, um, you know, how I like to think about it is that uh, the next 100 million investors in the crypto, the next 100 million crypto wallets that will be um, um, uh, brought online will look nothing like the first 100 million that we've, we've seen so far. I, I think what we're we are, we are witnessing is really a passing of the baton from the early adopters to now the early majority investors in crypto. And the early adopters were truly risk takers in every sense of the word. I mean, you know, investing in a, a novel asset class, uh, investing um, in, in a, you know, in a decentralized ecosystem, working in some places um, uh, and taking on you know, meaningful counterparty risk in some cases by working with unregulated uh, or loosely regulated um, startups uh, in order to get early exposure to crypto. And, and, you know, the next 100 million, the folks that we are seeing now come to the table are far more traditional capital allocators, you know, be it um, foundations, be it family, single family offices, multi-family offices, in some cases, even endowments and pensions uh, the world over that are um, right now engaging with ones of us like CoinHako, like Signum, um, and other regulated folks. I, I think they're uh, they're really 
um, I, I think let me classify the, uh, the, the differences in the implementation approach in a number of ways. Firstly, um, I think they're less likely to be thinking about direct token exposures in order to build uh, their crypto allocation. Right? I, I, you know, I, I had a, in a previous life, I was uh, um, working with um, cap, you know, large capital allocators, institutions to uh, build their private investment portfolios of private equity venture capital. And um, when we persuaded some of these institutions to start allocating, for example, to venture capital, you know, between day one, uh, when they had no venture capital exposure to day two, when they um, incorporated as part of their investment policy statements into their investable universe, uh, they didn't then uh, go out to start making seed and early stage direct investments in startups, right? What they typically did was to um, identify venture capital fund managers that they could allocate through. You know, analogous to that, this next wave of uh, investors in crypto, the early majority, we call them, um, they are more likely to consider crypto allocations via passive market tracking indices that give broad-based beta exposure to crypto or uh, in, in some select cases, active managers um, on the, both the hedge funds as well as the venture capital side uh, who can yeah, provide you know, alpha on top of just you know, uh, the beta exposure. Um, what they're far less interested in doing in many cases is to um, uh, start trading Bitcoin and Ethereum directly themselves and or hiring like you know a trading team in-house um, to do that for them. I, I think it, it's completely um, uh, you know not in the DNA of these um, uh, folks to be participating in the markets in such a trading oriented manner, right? They don't have, for example, a trading team to trade the FANGs or the BATSs uh, you know, on the on the on the on uh, the public equity side. So why would they do that do that just because it's crypto now? So I think that, that that's the biggest so sea change in behavior we're noticing as we speak to uh, this more mainstream cohort of investors that are uh, finally ready to take the plunge into, into crypto. Okay, th thanks, Gerald. And, and, and with that as a backdrop, um, one of the things that, that we see is, is the advent of, of regulation uh, in, in various jurisdictions. Um, and, and this is something which has been applied in different manners by, by, by different countries. So, Damien, I, I wanted to kind of turn uh, turn to you and, and just kind of hear from you a little bit in terms of um, the, the regulation and, and how that works vis-a-vis uh, -vis whether it's a, a burden, whether it should be seen as a compliance burden or a, or a commercial advantage or, or maybe a mix of the two. Yeah. So I, th I, I, I suppose, uh, um, as, as usual, and, and, and Gerald's alluding to, uh, I think there is a general uh, maturing of what we are seeing where uh, virtual assets or, 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 or blockchain-based uh, applications and, and tokens are, 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 are moving in a sense in, in the broader market itself. And with that, I think, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me get the disclaimer out of this one. Whatever I say down here represents the view of myself, not of the views of the MAS. Uh, yeah, but. But uh, as as the, as 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 usual, and, and Gerald was alluding to earlier, you do see a broader uh, developments as a as a market like I said, with regards to uh, uh, tokens, the blockchain based uh, application space per se, and and and, and therefore um, uh, as as we contend with all these developments, these evolutions, um, the, the 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 need for regulations does come in like I said, in terms of various angles. I think offset right right at the beginning, uh, you would have very heavily seen the applications on uh, anti-money laundering as well as counter-terrorism financing kind of uh, regulations and expectations. Then given that digital assets is very much technology, uh, then you also have uh, expectations that, that's imposed onto such plays uh, on the technology and cyber risk management. Now, uh, but do we see more uh, regulations that uh, uh, will come on? Do we see that as uh, uh, something of uh, too heavy for uh, businesses? I, I, I think it has to commensurate with regards to the uh, specific blockchain-based applications and tokens, the specific business areas that they are in, and, and, and therefore the specific regulations will have to be right-fitted to, to the specific uh, their domains. Lah, in sense. Just as we expect that uh, if someone is using tokens for uh, primarily for payments with the purposes, stable coins as an example. So we would expect that the, the kind of regulations applicable to them uh, 
uh, would be different from securities-based tokens. And, and that's something that you do see broadly in the global uh, regulatory scene. In the sense. Uh, regulators uh, over the past few years have, uh, got, have uh, um, gotten themselves in touch with such blockchain and tokens-based developments and kind of have a better understanding and then therefore have been right sizing the kind of expectations around regulations. So I wouldn't say that the uh, it compliance is, is going to be a heavy burden, but I would say that uh, it commensurates with the growth. Uh, and, and we should see that uh, uh, it helping uh, the healthy development, towards the healthy development of sense broadly uh, of, of such uh, players in, in these spaces. And then the key thing is about the right sizing uh, in accordance to the specific domains. Now, we, we are not going to regulate uh, 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 to, to general spoiler, in a sense, uh, if, if the practices are different in, between Signum Switzerland and Signum Singapore, we're not going to impose the same set of regulations on, uh, as, as is imposed uh, uh, in, in Signum Switzerland or in Signum Singapore itself. So I think it's, it's about uh, helping the, towards uh, a healthy development of, of the industry itself. But again, as, as you have uh, also seen the developments uh, globally, they are still quite uneven in, a sense, in terms of the expectations. I think AML CFD requirements has been quite uh, uniform because of uh, the uh, FATF kind of uh, 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 specific guidelines that they put in place. Uh, but I think by and large, the other aspects will probably take some time before we see a broader uh, uniformity in sense when it comes to regulations. But I do see it as um, necessity for healthy development of the industry. Yep, over. Okay, thank, thanks, Damien. And, and you sure what's what's your observations in respect of the the impact of, of regulatory regimes being imposed in in, in different jurisdictions? Uh, I mean, we, we can start with Singapore first. All uh, right. So you know, we started a company twenty fourteen. Back then, uh, Bitcoin or crypto wasn't regulated, um, and and therefore you know a lot of people, banks. Uh, Regulators, they're looking at crypto as a, a form of you know internet play money, um, right? And and today I think with with MAS uh, regulating not just MAS but you know global regulators, right? This orchestrates this whole shift in uh, perception, right? Uh, uh, institutions will look at it differently. Uh, retail will get more comfortable. It gives them uh, confidence to try something new, and you know this really creates a, a ripple effect. And you know, over time, uh, you know, guys like EUI, um, uh, law firms, and, and the peripheral services around it uh, will also uh, um, grow with the industry. I think in, in um, Damien's words, uh, I think there's a healthy development of the whole ecosystem. Uh, you know, but you know, for every regulation, there's always the good, bad, and ugly. Uh, but I think key thing is, you know, how do we find the right balance? And you know, so far, I believe uh, you know, uh, Singapore has been a, a, a good spot for, for crypto. Um, I mean, just based on the number of international uh, applicants uh, coming into the space, right? Uh, just looking at the numbers and, and these numbers uh, don't lie, right? Um, so, but then again, you know, uh, it really depends on the DNA of, of each and every company or the founder, right? Um, uh, but at least for us, you know, this is something we have embraced uh, from the start, um, and yeah, and and yeah, we are we are open and uh, and we we embrace uh, regulations as a company. Okay, and 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 Gerald, from the from the kind of institutional angle, um, is is it fair to say that uh, you know the presence of, of regulations uh, tends to be positive in the sense of um, you know perceptions in the market credibility. Um, and, and, and ability, in particular, for other regulated businesses uh, to, you know, to conduct business. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think obviously we're biased. Uh, Adam must declare that, right? We have, uh, we have uh, never, um, just to underscore, offered anything uh, to the market until we were regulated to do so. Um, but that was a very conscious uh, choice that we made, like usual, um, when we launched uh, the the regulatory frameworks governing crypto and other digital assets were unclear pretty much uh, across the globe. So it was a choice to work hand in hand with um, uh, regulators in the right uh, jurisdictions in order to help them um, um, sharpen re regulation and to regulate responsibly in a way that would balance out um, financial market innovation, um, job creation and, uh, and investor protection. And I don't think it's a, you know, I, I, 
I don't envy Damien and the team at the MS. It's, it's not an easy balance to, to strike, but I think uh, by and large, the MS and also FINMA, the regulator in Switzerland, has done an exceedingly good job. Right? Um, for us, uh, the maturation and institutionalization of crypto goes hand in hand with uh, more regulatory clarity and oversight. And um, um, we also expect more regulatory scrutiny and enforcement. I think it's absolutely re uh, a, a requirement um, that the rules of the road are made clear for everyone so that in particular, the institutional investors, the, uh, the long-term capital allocators can participate with complete trust and peace of mind. Um, and we are seeing already the, the benefits of regulatory clarity um, uh, take root in the space in terms of the increased uh, uptake right, of interest from, uh, again, um, uh, the serious money uh, uh, investors. So um, for us, uh, day one till now, it's always been a prerequisite before we do business. And I think uh, in the, uh, we are already starting to see uh, the fruits of regulatory compliance and regulatory clarity start to, to grow. I, 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 for us, uh, uh, for me, actually, I just speak for myself, uh, a prediction about um, the, like the road ahead. I, I do think that, um, uh, and we saw it again with uh, you know, the, the, the sanctions um, conversation top, topic and the market reaction um, um, in, the, in, the, in the last few uh, days and weeks, um, that uh, the sort of the playing field for unregulated crypto operators will only get more and more narrow um, over time. And uh, the ones of us that are sitting on the regulated side of, of the industry, I, I think, um, you know, at least we can say, I'm sure you sure myself that we sleep very soundly at night knowing that uh, we are in full compliance with, with the regulations and, uh, and our clients um, can also sleep soundly knowing that the assets are safe and protected. Yeah, so maybe uh, Adam, may, may I jump in with one quick point? Uh, because uh, yeah. uh, uh, I think Gerald has raised a very good point about uh, the past of the future, like, sense around that um, instead of seeing, from my perspective, uh, instead of seeing regulations and regulated uh, parties uh, uh, in, in, in this space itself uh, being a, bo uh, a burden in a sense, I will see as that uh, it's increasingly going to be a, a market advantage. In, in the same way, in a sense, as, as we move towards an industry which is going to be one side, which is um, uh, where parties are being regulated appropriately uh, in a way at which uh, uh, allows the, the, the specific players themselves to be able to uh, 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 provide services to customers in the crypto or digital, uh, virtual asset space itself. And then you have the other side, which is uh, those that may not be regulated or may not be regulated as appropriately in a sense. You are going to find that uh, we will, as, as we are right now in the transition phase, but you are going to find that uh, we will move towards where uh, broader recognition globally that uh, these parties are whom you could be working with. It's kind of obvious which side you kind of choose between that. So I tend to do not see it as a burden, but more in terms of uh, we are currently in this transition phase. Uh, it will take a while for it to uh, go forward, but you are going to find that uh, which side will have seen it as a, a market advantage. Like I said. I kind of think that, that that is more likely to happen. Yeah, over. Yeah, I, I think that make that makes sense as well because um, you know the uh, that extra the extra credibility I think is a, is a key thing once once companies are operating in that regulatory environment. Um, uh, but the other thing is that you know especially with the institutional uh, uh, interest in this area and that's picked up significantly over the last year or two. Um, you know, it's, it's a very different proposition for institutionals um, to start interacting with with uh, with service providers such as crypto exchanges or, or wealth managers, um, and and you know for the, for them with with those uh, you know their own control requirements and system requirements, um, you know I think there is a there is a very good case that they would uh, commercially prefer to to deal with with um, with companies that that are regulated and, and do have that uh, extra layer of, of credibility. So moving on to, to, to looking at the wider ecosystem, um, you know, in the, in the past 
there were some challenges, I think, for, for some of the early, uh, early operators in, in, in this space in respect of uh, how they uh, deal with service providers and, and in particular things like, you know, in the past things like uh, even dealing with banks was, was a challenge. Um, but then, then more recently, um, you know, in particular in wealth management, uh, you know, wealth management operates usually with a network of um, or an ecosystem of, of service pro service providers such as uh, fund admin custodians, uh, then other service providers such as you know audit and law firms and, and what have you. So, Gerald, I wonder if you could just give us your observations on 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 how that uh, has kind of changed and evolved over the last couple of years and where we are now. Yeah, I mean, I think. Just to pick up on the point that Damien um, raised as well, I, I think as the market transitions to one where regulatory frameworks are uh, clear and are being enforced, uh, you no longer have uh, on the client side the the fig leaf of you know oh uh, yes I would like to be I would like to work with regulated counterparts but you know none exists and so I have no choice but to you know choose uh, unregulated player X and Y and Z. Um, I think those days are hopefully uh, coming to an end sooner rather than later. Consequently, um, folks that invest uh, or want to participate in the space um, have to uh, ensure that uh, similarly to what they do for other asset classes that they work with a suite of regulated trusted counterparts um, across banking, uh, custody, but also tax, uh, audit uh, reporting, compliance. I, I think those things um, that we've so far, um, um, most early participants uh, in the space have not had to contend with or not be paid too much heed to will become increasingly important. Um, certainly one of the benefits that the clients of our bank in Switzerland um, um, tell us uh, as, as one of the reasons why they, they, they uh, open accounts with us in Switzerland is because they can um, have their printout of their digital asset and the crypto holdings via the e-banking platform at Signum Bank um, and then pass this on to their tax or financial advisor in the way they would do for assets that are custodied with, uh, you know, state, state traditional assets that are custodied with State Street or Northern Trust or other custodian banks. Um, and, and this um, sort of level of familiarity um, and working with, you know, regulated financial service infrastructure providers like, like Signum, um, I, I, again, I, I think um, will become increasingly important right, in, the, in, the, in the months and years um, to come. And, so, and we're already seeing it uh, in Switzerland and Singapore as well, as we open up our platform to offer more regulated activities, uh, we truly believe that it's the understanding and appreciation of traditional, how traditional asset management, traditional finance works uh, that will pave the way for broader mainstream adoption of, of crypto and digital assets. Yeah, so I mean, one of the one of the things that 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 we see is is you know that broader um, suite of companies that support um, entities that are that are dealing in this ecosystem uh, in general have have really started to ramp up uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so you know, there's 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 custodians that have developed; they're quite large. Um, they have they have systems and processes in place which um, which allow them allow allow other companies to, to to trust them with what are usually substantial investment sizes. Um, and you know from from our perspective at, at EY, we've been we've been developing our audit methodologies now for, for several years um, in respect of digital assets. We've we have a consistent global methodology that all of our teams can apply. Um, we have our blockchain analyzer tool, which is which is now I think on its third iteration, um, which has been around for, for, for several years as well. Um, it's a really good tool because it enables our, our audit teams to go directly into the respective blockchains for the major cryptocurrencies via a live node. Um, so we can see at any point in time what's happening on the blockchain. We can look at any transactions that have ever occurred. 
Um, and then the really cool thing about it is we can then go and um, reconcile that uh, or use that tool to then reconcile against our, our client records. And I think you know all, all of these kind of innovations that, that a lot of the, uh, the kind of service providers have been uh, implementing is, is you know it is helpful and, and in, in, many, in many ways it's very necessary for the for the wider ecosystem and, and for all those things to kind of grow at the, at the same kind of pace. So just for the last the last few minutes, we're coming towards the end. Um, so maybe I could just get uh, a, a quick view from from all three of you as to where do you see things over the next uh, year or two. Um, just one or two things that you think are going to be critical uh, things to kind of watch out for. So maybe I can go to you first. Uh, you Yeah, um, so I, I think for me, uh, digital identity is, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I think digital identity is a space that will grow potentially, right? With the um, you know, incoming CBDCs um, and, you know, with a huge uh, market cap of stable coins out there, uh, you know, I, I believe that there will be a, a growing need for these on-chain identities, uh, whether it's centralized or semi-centralized. Um, and so I think on top of that, uh, what, what's more interesting is, you know, with the, the current uh, situation that's going on in the world, I read an article on this uh, helpless uh, Russian tourists being stranded in Thailand, right? Uh, they have no flights back, credit cards uh, were blocked, uh, and, and because of that, they can't withdraw money from ATMs, uh, and, and this leaves them completely helpless. All right, and uh, this is the unwanted uh, consequence of uh, sanctions. All right, and being the platform from all financial services uh, in a time like this, it's it's really not easy. Uh, you know, it's, this is speaking from uh, experience where you know I, I personally got unbanked by some of the banks, and you know having no access to simple things like you know a, a credit card or withdrawing money, and you know this is. Uh, not a nice thing to go through, All right? Uh, so I think yeah, this will further improve the uh, this will further prove the importance of of digital assets in the next uh, twelve months. <clears throat> okay, thanks, thanks, Yusho. Uh Damien, what's, what's your thoughts? Yep. Uh, so so um, on the technology front, I do believe that the uh, uh, sustainability and green is more likely to be uh, featuring more. The emphasis, especially when we talk about the institutional uh, investors per se, in the sense, or accredited investors, as they um, recognize this as an important area, paying more emphasis and and, and, and making sure that they the what they park, where they park their money in, in a sense, is creating an impact. Uh, I suspect green and sustainability will be a gender uh, uh, on on the uh, virtual assets front, but I, I do believe or uh, some uh, generally uh, comments around um, the non-green aspects of existing blockchain platforms uh, has, has been rather overdone. We've been looking at blockchain from a, a historical set of lenses. Uh, and, 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 and to us, all of us, we see technology. Uh, there's only one trajectory path right, says for technology. It gets better. And with each uh, iterations or each new technology platform of, of the blockchain itself, uh, we do find that, uh, yes, you started with Bitcoin, uh, very poor with regards to its uh, uh, green fundamentals. Uh, but if you look at the newer kind of platforms that are using uh, uh, different sets of consensus mechanisms, uh, they are much more greener. And, and I do see in the next 12 to 18 months, we are going to see a lot more of this emphasis there uh, in supporting platforms that are likely to be uh, uh, having such great interests like mine. Yeah. Thanks. Over. Thanks, Damien. And then last but not least, uh, Gerald, what's, what's your thoughts Thank of you. to finish up? Yeah, I think the thing to look out for over the next 12 to 24 months is really that shift in the implementation approach and the behavior of investors in the crypto space as we transition to the next 100 million uh, wallets. Right? I, I do think that uh, the role of asset management and the asset management industry, which has so far been muted when you look at the amount of attention that has been poured on the direct token side, also you know the, the, the global crypto ex exchanges that have been lionized in the press. Um, I, I think those will fall away um, a little bit as the, you know, the black rocks uh, of uh, crypto uh, start to emerge. 
um, and as the institutional investors uh, start to demand um, um, asset management product to implement their crypto exposures through. So uh, that's where we are certainly paying a lot of attention to and, and, and also um, um, innovating a lot of uh, fund products uh, to service this uh, inbound, we believe, uh, growing demand. And so uh, it, since I have the last word, thank you so much, Adam, for that. I, I always end uh, these with a call to action on the part of the attendees. Um, for us, uh, and I think all the other panelists, it, it's certainly uh, the case where you know, staying, uh, I, I, uh, coming into the space, I think it's important for everyone to get um, to do two things. One, get informed and then uh, get involved because uh, um, the disruption potential of uh, digital assets, I think, become more evident uh, every day. I don't think you can afford to sit on the sideline and miss out on this mega trend. All right. Thank you, Gerald, and, and appreciate the, uh, the, the final words there. So th thank you very much to, the, to all three of the, the panelists. Um, Really great to have you with us today and thanks very much for your insights. The next session is going to be on uh, the future of digital assets. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Mark, who's going to moderate that session. Mark, you're still on mute there. Thanks. Start again. Um, a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you, Adam and panel, for giving us an update on the current state. We're now going to dive a little bit deeper and spend some time looking at the future state, particularly from an APAC lens. My name is Mark Wyman. I'm delighted to be joined today by an experienced and insightful panelist. I have Oyi Cho, who's the CEO of ADEX and leading licensed tokenization platforms. I have ZK Lee, Managing Director, Chief Digital Data and Innovation Officer from HSBC Security Services, and Hassan Ahmed, the head of our Southeast Asia for Coinbase. So let's get straight into things. We hear a lot about tokenization. Maybe Oye, I can start with you, but what type of assets are being tokenized? How are they selected? And what's resonating with investors today? Thanks, uh, Mark. It's great to be with you all uh, here this afternoon. Uh, and it was a very interesting session uh, just before ours. And, and I would say that this is a great uh, starting point for what is in the future. In fact, we already see the future, right? I mean, we, we now know that tokenization and blockchain is a very powerful platform at which many, many disruptions are happening within financial services. Uh, we are currently expressing that through the private markets. So we set up uh, initially with a view to democratizing private markets. Uh, we looked at how blockchain could be really the core technology around that. Uh, we are now sort of developed around 40 uh, use, well, we've actually in production 40 um, examples of that. Uh, so we have private equity funds, VC funds, uh, real estate, private real estate with uh, short-term paper, you know, like commercial papers, even long-term bonds. So we're already taking what are traditional securities and tokenizing that for a very uh, different use case and a different market. So we're targeting the high net worth investors that are currently underserved by the private bank. Um, and we see that already as an important use case. And, and you know, just before I hand over to my other esteemed colleagues, I also start to see new use cases on alternative assets to have come to us to talk about what might be next in the investable universe. So it's not just about traditional securities and funds, but moving on to things like, you know, wine or art or cars or luxury uh, collectibles. And how do they think about tokenizing some of that for uh, investment purposes? Okay, so lots of exciting things coming there, Oyi, thank you. So maybe flipping it around a little bit, I mean, ZK, as a, as a traditional, as a traditional player, HSBC, what, what does tokenization mean to you today? And where do you see that coming into your sort of future strategy? Yeah, so I think totally agree with what OE has said, right? So um, it, uh, basically the move towards tokenized asset, right, is not an unfamiliar one. If you look at how the traditional finance has evolved over the past, past decades, right? So it is just the next form of asset representation. Okay, so when we look at the move from paper certificates to dematerialized asset and then to tokenized asset. So this has actually potentially and significantly increased the market cap and trading volume because it's now easier to trade, right? So 
cryptocurrencies are the first tokens to gain popularity but since then we have seen many more asset type being tokenized as what OE has um, shared earlier then that would of course include traditional securities so actually i think we should talk about a bit on the benefit that the tokenization has bring to us right so largely the tokenization benefit will fall into three big areas so the first one is about liquidity and efficiency so so speaking of traditional securities right one of the early use case was definitely bonds okay so and the reason why asset like bonds were chosen right was because tokenization is particularly beneficial in terms of moving liquidity through fractionalization and also the use of smart contracts to automate process flow and increase efficiency etc so moving to tokenization is a tech upgrade especially for the for the asian bond markets that tend to operate on legacy tech and manual operational flows okay so that is one of the benefit that 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 tokenized asset has bring about the second one is more on financial inclusion so um what fractionalization brings about is about improving the access to investment opportunities to a wider investor base so asia i would say that is an ideal test bed for tokenization and it is the home to a population that would actually benefit from the increased transparency and accessibility to the securities market so if you look at APEC, right, APEC is actually responsible for the overall majority, up to around 90% of the 2.4 billion new members of the, of the middle class, class that's entering the global economy. So the bulk of that growth will come from developing markets of China, India, and Southeast Asia. So APEC is also the home to the largest number of internet users. Okay, so it is, it is a population that is increasingly comfortable with using cryptocurrencies and cashless payment um, and a growing young middle class with economic influence okay so that is the second reason why we 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 need to organize asset and last but not least right we we should look at the benefit that's brought about by innovation right so tokenization can actually accelerate the broader product innovation in financial markets so new areas which include the security token offering that is backed by financial assets such as shares in unlisted companies which are the, the private asset type uh, bonds and private equity funds right so the opportunities are limitless in terms of the type of tokenized asset or the tokenized product that can be created so in recent years we have seen a growth in platforms that's offering products such as tokenized gold real estate and carbon credit which are experiencing significant demand from investors and in 2021, right, we have also seen the rise in NFT, which is around 27 billion, which was poured into the NFT market across um, tokenized art, uh, games, tweets, and more. Okay, so this actually reflect a market embracing tokenization as a means to monetize asset and digital tokens. So the rise of NFT has also fueled the discussion on Web3 and the metaverse, right? So, and that's why we are the big financial institution uh, and everyone in the financial industry is trying to look at tokenized, uh, tokenized asset as a next step. Thanks, okay. So I've got a long list of benefits there. Actually, maybe quickly, Oi, maybe I can flip back to you. I mean, clearly ZK has given some really um, clear sort of bottom-up benefits from the industry. Obviously, a lot of your clients, you know, who are coming to you are big institutional players who are looking at tokenization. Why are they coming to you? What are the benefits that they see using a platform? Yeah, I think uh, ZK very, very well uh, described uh, what exactly is happening in the market and, and you know, why uh, exactly we think that we are aligned in the right space uh, is exactly because when we built the democratization idea, um, a lot of that in the, is happening in the private market space because from the public markets where we're seeing alpha and where we're seeing, well, capital flows, frankly, is into the private market space. But what was not happening was that the product design out of that was not moving towards uh, individual investors. So it was very, very hard to democratize that without tech. And in reality, tokenization prevent, provides a platform for fractionalization and liquidity, which is what exactly ZK is saying. When, when an individual looks at private markets, what the, the biggest impediments is one, the minimum size, and two, uh, the liquidity of that particular product. So it was not well serving to the uh, high net worth individuals and you know and again you could solve that in very rudimentary ways you could take an excel spreadsheet and, and fractionalize that 
but the scalability and therefore the full accessibility power comes with tokenization. Um, and, and on top of that, it's not just about Web, well, web 3.0, but also what tools do we, what do we use to work with investors to do that? And, and for us, for example, the app has been very powerful. And all the information around uh, each particular product you can pull up on a single page. So um, I think that what that's done is actually increase the wealth tools of, um, you know, certainly to the high net worth individuals who are not so well served. But over time, if you think about how powerful that is, financial inclusion is a very big topic. And this, the, the technology as it gets better and the regulation gets clearer, this will definitely move towards a retail and open up a whole new avenue of uh, wealth um, ideas for, for retail. So the benefits are obviously clear there in terms of liquidity size for that democratization. Flipping around from the other side, the institutional investors who are coming onto your platform, what are they? What are they gain? Because obviously many of these are big names. They've got already a lot of dry powder. Yeah, I think there are many different. Well, I mean, the private markets is actually quite wide, right? I mean, it, we have what is yeah. traditionally the fund space, the PE funds, VC funds, mm -hmm. private resource are very naturally accredited investor focused because you know the, the frankly the sovereign wealth funds are, are well uh, attuned to that already but we also are looking at things like bonds and 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 credit and in that space there is an argument that um, there is some fundamental changes that tokenization brings that shift that should shift the way institutional capital looks at liquidity around bonds it is probably a longer game to be played. But if you think about the inefficiencies of the current capital markets, uh, a lot of that is solved with tokenization, instantaneous settlement, you know, cross-border clearing. Uh, I, I think this, this is a very, very deep change that will happen eventually. Okay, that's, that's very clear. So clearly investable universes are getting much, much bigger. Um, you know, we're even starting to talk about the financialization of, of everything. I mean, Hassan, um, Coinbase, clearly uh, been a lot of uh, press around um, distinction and, and sort of technological breakthroughs to point out as a result of, of um, sort of Web3 and blockchains is that uh, it is uh, not just sort of fractionalized, but it's also permissionless and sort of accessible to anyone with, you know, a connection and an order, whoever wants to participate. And so as a result, like foundationally, what we're seeing differently is that the, the the velocity of emergent behavior in this ecosystem is completely unparalleled and, and just very different from anything that we've seen before. And I think in some ways, this is also why it makes it a very sort of retail first uh, market structure uh, in the way that it's sort of built up and now is sort of starting to come mature up uh, both in terms of, you know, uh, late adopters, uh, as well as sort of institutional participation. But I, I think it's uh, it, it's what's exciting is that you know because of these emergent behaviors like to date absolutely like I think after kind of all we would just call like fungible tokens you know non fungible tokens are, are very much in the spotlight and they're starting to kind of you know sort of map almost one to one in terms of like how real world assets behave where most of you know what we see and and sort of own and touch and feel is you know non fungible and then you know fungible is like a pretty kind of discrete asset class and I think NFTs will eventually sort of you know map further along uh, to it. I also think that, you know, because of this sort of new behavior, we're seeing things that, you know, frankly, that wouldn't have been almost impossible to predict, like, let's say a year and a half ago, uh, themes like play to, play to earn, which is at this sort of intersection of uh, blockchain, gaming, and gig economy. And it's because, uh, you know, uh, these developers and builders have, like, brought together, you know, this Web 2 and Web 3 stack in a sort of an intelligent way, uh, which uses NFTs, which uses uh, regular tokens, and just sort of, you know, general kind of, you know, game mechanics and, and gaming engines to deliver experiences to sort of the end user, which is now allowing users to uh, earn crypto instead of buying it. And, and so, you know, within the kind of this construct of, you know, having an NFT marketplace, which, you know, we'll, we're, we're excited to be sort of announcing uh, sort of in the near future, uh, I think it's, it's providing access to both uh, retail users as well as, uh, you know, retail buyers and institutional uh, buyers to be able to kind of transact across this sort of new global marketplace model. Thanks, Hassan. I think, you know, clearly we're sitting here in Asia Pack. We see markets evolving in, in different ways. Now, you just mentioned play to earn. This is a phenomenon we haven't really seen so much outside the region. Obviously, Philippines was a great leader, Axie Infinity, um, et cetera. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about, you know, when you think from a Coinbank's perspective and the unique, you know, about 
how this region is unique and equally what does that mean in terms of the opportunities um, for a firm like yourself and equally for you know the end retail and institutional investors yeah i think blockchain gaming is, is sort of one of the i think first sort of consumer level application and experiences that that has really kind of broken through to a like near scale and escape velocity at this point um, I also expect, you know, other kind of emerging use cases like decentralized social media and, you know, eventually kind of decentralized ride share and, and all that to sort of come, uh, you know, come up to scale as well. There's just too much uh, a developer and energy and kind of resources being thrown at this now. Um, but but what's exciting about, you know, Play to Earn is, is that it is very much a, an Asia first and almost an SEA first um, uh, uh, phenomena because Sky Mavis is, is in Vietnam and most of the Axie players today and Play to Earn players are in the Philippines. Uh, and I think it just sort of goes to show like when you're sort of building locally uh, and you have sort of these these kind of you know markets and regulatory regimes that provide clarity for you know users to be able to access crypto and sort of cash in cash out with like healthy liquidity uh, it can lead to you know these sort of unexpected behaviors and you know in this case it's it's sort of decouple like a local labor market for you know workers to be able to earn in the metaverse uh, and and sort of really you know kind of change lives and like have very real economic and financial impact uh, in a way that was impossible to foresee, uh, you know, not too long ago. Yeah, I think that's phenomenal. You know, as we've seen many articles, but this is really has, as you said, this has changed lives. We've already talked about financial inclusion, democratization of private markets, some really interesting stuff going on here. I mean, ZK, maybe going back to you, you know, you've already mentioned the term uh, Web3 a few times. We now started to get into how Asia is different. What does this mean to a bank like HSBC? Okay, okay. Um... So a simple one for you. Yeah, so so I think we are at a critical juncture, right, for existing financial institution to to really to explore, to experiment, and to take calculated risk. Um, especially when it comes to Web3 and the metaverse as well, right? So from my point of view, right, where there's an economy, right, there will be intermediaries that is providing services. Okay, and financial services will continue to be a necessity even in the metaverse itself. So, and that's why traditional financial institutions like HSBC would be able to play an important role in the transition to Web3. Okay, so while the concept of traditional finance is, is actually quite centralized, right? And the decentralized ecosystem that's Web3 may seem to be conflicting, but the reality is probably both would need to work together to make Web3 a success, okay? So, so for example, right, um, financial institution can provide the infrastructure that is necessary to issue, to safe keep, to service the tokenized asset, because some of the players may, may not have that um, funding to actually invest in all these type of infrastructure. So in, uh, and in addition, right, financial institution can, can actually, can actually um, uh, straddle the traditional and tokenized asset network so that we can actually provide a seamless experience to our client across both worlds, right? So secondly, I think, um, and realistically, right, they, there needs to be a trusted regulated entity like financial institution who can responsibly provide the bridge to DeFi protocol, for example, while protecting the customer, okay? So if you look at the NFT world, right, they, uh, recently, I think there are a lot of fraud cases, okay? so. So I think definitely banks have a role to play to ensure the authenticity of the NFTs. Okay, so, and in a nutshell, we believe that it has to be a combination of DeFi and SendFi to make Web3 a success. Right? So some of the opportunities that we feel that we are actually looking at is, of course, the first thing is on NFT as an investable asset. So along with traditionally acknowledged in uh, investable asset like wine and art, etc. So the increased interest in NFT may lead to its inclusion in the alternative investment portfolios. Okay, so, so definitely it is what the asset managers are looking at right now and how do we service them. Okay, the second opportunity I would think is on structuring products. So if we look at smart contract, right, we, we know that it is a highly composable type of instrument. Okay, so this actually allows us to easily and efficiently structure a broad range of financial products. For example, uh, new layered products like Net Zero Gold, which is essentially tokenized gold product, but it is structured in such a way that each ounce of gold that is being purchased, right, sufficient carbon credit tokens will be bought to offset the carbon footprint of the gold. 
So this actually provides the investor a sustainable way to invest in commodities and facilitates the transition to a non-zero economy. And then thirdly, right, the other opportunity is on custody, of course. So with Web3, we are likely to see an explosion of new assets due to smart contract and uh, etc. So the rapid growth of NFT is an early example of this, right? So secure custody of this asset will be critical to drive the adoption and build the investor confidence in this ecosystem. Okay, and then uh, if we talk about metaverse, right? It is it is about access, lending, and virtual branch. So the opportunity for banks would be in the metaverse should mirror the real world. Okay, assuming that is a parallel universe, right? From lending to opening of virtual branches and service centers to even to being the channel to the metaverse uh, for the institutional client. And, and I think last but not least, right, is the universal adapter to asset network. So as a bank, we will be able to in a, in a position to provide a connectivity platform to provide interoperability between uh, TradeFi and DeFi, et cetera, and allow clients to access various digital asset uh, networks or ecosystem uh, via a single bridge. And, we, and we can help to connect to the CBDC net, uh, network as well. So that's where I see all the opportunities for a bank. Okay, so we've got complete digital twins in your, in, in your future state now. If we look at the real world today and we look at the traditional banks, I mean, the metaverse to date, a few of your peers have bought a bit of land and decentralized. It, it seems to be a bit of marketing. Um, I, I'm interested, maybe let's have a little bit of fun because we've got the crypto native and we've got the traditional player here. But you know, if we come back to the real world today, ZK, I mean, where does metaverse actually sort of fit into to sort of your roadmap? I mean, how, how real how real is this? Okay, okay, I okay. So from the bank's well, perspective, right? people, right? but at least we can we can get a crypto native and we can get a you know a traditional uh, perspective. Yeah. So so I think metaverse is of course up and coming. So um, it is definitely a part of our portfolio going forward. So what we are doing now is really a lot of experiments on. Uh, DLT bridge. So, um, and and actually my vision for the team, right, is to be an omnipresent security services provider, okay, for our clients in their, in their operations. So what that means, right, if any clients would need access to the DeFi space, right, or the uh, DeFi ecosystem, can we actually play a role there by being the bridge to help them to get access to, to, to all the DeFi protocol, to the lending, to the derivative that's, hap that's happening in that space. Even though some sometimes our risk appetite may not allow us to participate in some of this uh, uh, network or uh, or even hold cryptocurrency on our balance sheet, etc. Right, but definitely we can still facilitate this type of services for our clients. Okay, thanks, ZK, and I appreciate you taking that one uh, on the spot. So Hassan, let's flip it around to um, you know the the crypto or digital native. How how do you you know how do you see metaverse playing out in your role within that? And how does that contrast perhaps to, uh, you know, to some of the views from uh, ZK? Uh, sure. Actually, just before that, I, I have a few suggestions that I would love for, for ZK to, to kind of take up. <laughs> I, I don't care whether it comes from crypto native or TradFi, but I think what's severely missing in, in, in sort of the space right now is true risk underwriting. Uh, I think people are just giving zero credit to any kind of earnings capabilities or sort of flow of cash or cash flow because it's coming from this space. Uh, you know, you can sort of put in the right LTV, but like, you know, it's not zero and we know that. So I would love for like some banks to kind of be aggressive about uh, under collateralized uh, lending in this space. Uh, and then I, I, I think that there's a, a separate sort of thread here, which is, you know, we talk about, about play to earn, but I actually think that the, the real uh, opportunity is, here is play to own. So financing solutions to scholars that allow them to sort of, uh, you know, buy sort of their own NFTs up front and then just pay it down so that they end up with true ownership. Because that is sort of the ethos of being in, in this space, right? Where you have immutable digital property rights. And I think sort of guilds are also uh, moving in that direction, but there's absolutely no reason that, you know, banks should be looking at it. Anyone with sort of uh, lending and financing kind of warehouses should be looking at it. I think Coinbase and other kind of crypto native folks should be looking at it because eventually it's about empowering sort of the end user and improving uh, economic outcomes. And I, I think that that's something that, that is um, sort of a burning top of mind for me at least. Um, in terms of, you know, what else sort of uh, Coinbase is thinking about to enable the metaverse, as I mentioned, you know, one of our kind of uh, end user segments is, is developers. So, you know, we are fast moving into this sort of multi-chain reality and sort of the complexity of 
uh, uh, operating or just keeping the lights on, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the infrastructure level is also increasing uh, exponentially. So uh, we have a, a, a platform called Coinbase Cloud that allows developers to sort of deploy uh, natively multi-chain. Uh, and I think solutions like that and platforms like that, that abstract away the complexity for the, the builders uh, to really kind of build on experiences and application layers, um, I think is, is going to be critical uh, to make sure that the industry uh, can move forward as well. Fantastic. It sounds like we need to get a bit of a whiteboard out and get everybody in a room and start planning out some of this stuff. There's, uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, innovation here that we can uh, put, put the party together and, and move forward. Okay. Um, conscious of time, but we talked a little bit earlier about making, making things accessible, making it easy, but clearly this is still a very new market. You know, Paul mentioned it earlier. We're still at the very, very early days and, and we've all got a responsibility to help educate, provide comfort, you know, make it easier to start. So, you know, how are we helping that? I mean, maybe, or you, this going back to you, you know, you talked about democratization of private markets, but how are you helping educate investors, helping it, you know, making it easy for them to actually come onto your platform and then potentially to invest in a new asset class? Yeah, we, we realized very early on um, that, first of all, we had to think about what were the key messages that we were delivering. And, and I think in the early days, between the word tokenization and private markets, I think uh, it was something that was a bit overwhelming because, you know, it was the start of COVID, you know, and all of that, and people don't want to hear too many sort of big, scary words. We, we realized that what we were doing was creating a different business model. Uh, and, and really making private markets accessible. So we kind of defocused on the technology and really focused on what we're delivering as key benefits to, to um, in individual investors. But it also showed us that there were there needed to be quite a deep education in the space. So there are a lot of investors, for example, are, who are very deep into crypto, but they actually have a lesser understanding of what private markets is and how they can potentially balance out their crypto holdings or balance out their public market holding. So we spent a long time uh, uh, sort of really holding webinars. We were simplifying a lot of the, uh, you know, term terminology and jargon of the traditional private markets. Uh, you know, we have a team on standby if our clients want, our investors want to understand what's the difference between this management fee and that management fee, this uh, PE product versus that PE product. Uh, and I think there's a long, long way to go. Again, because the space is so nascent, uh, we're continually having to develop uh, thought pieces and webinars and, and all of that. But as a, as a digitally native uh, company, thankfully, we've learned to use that, those tools very effectively. And uh, I think there's, there's a lot more we can do to, to do that. Plus, if you, if you think about what this session is about, it's actually the future, right? And so it's not just about the current what we're taking, which is traditional products into tokenization, but what does tokenization do for the future of alternative investing? Uh, you know, and, and that's that's a very big and deep topic. Thanks, Oyi. Uh, Hassan, coming back to you, clearly you have a large retail client base already, as well as your institutional services, you've got your NFT services coming up. I mean, you're covering a wide spectrum. How are you educating people? How can you get people to really understand the potential risks that they are taking and, and how to do things safely. Yeah, I think education uh, and onboarding is, is a topic that we're very passionate about uh, at Coinbase. I, the, there's, you know, the, a lot of times that, are, you know, people are, are seeing kind of, you know, headlines or they're just sort of reading about like the hot new crypto assets somewhere. And, and that's sort of, you know, where they're wanting to start from. But uh, underneath sort of the, the kind of there's an entire sort of utility glare and, and just a lot that's sort of going on in terms of the community ethos. So one of the ways that we're, we're, we're trying to address this very proactively is we, we productize uh, sort of education through a product called Coinbase Earn, where we invite projects to come in and, and sort of sponsor educational videos on our platform that our users can go and watch. They'll sort of take a quiz uh, and uh, they get like a little sort of incentive uh, at the end that's sort of deposited into their account. Um, so it's just a, a way to kind of really understand like, hey, if I want to buy X token, what is the project actually about? And that hopefully starts them on their journey to, to really wanting to understand uh, crypto and blockchain uh, a lot better. I think beyond that, we've also invested just a, a lot of uh, uh, folks and, and time on, you know, our Coinbase blog. We have sort of podcasts, we have Twitter spaces. We, we're trying to do a lot of engagement in meeting sort of new and pers uh, prospective users also where they are. Uh, so that we can also kind of get ahead uh, of the curve and help them sort of come in safely. Okay. And, and maybe Zika, I'll come back to you. I mean, you mentioned earlier, 
Um, and actually, it was you mentioned at the end of the last session, we might see some of the more institutional players, the asset managers moving into this space. We, we've seen a few asset managers recently in the last couple of weeks just come out and say they're thinking about NFT as a potential investor base. Um, how are you helping? Because in many cases, you're going to have to co-create with your institutional clients and get them up to speed. And they may well not be as, as savvy in some cases as some of the retail investors who are you know, fully up to speed on their YouTube, TikTok and uh, other, other platforms. Um, how, how are you helping? Because clearly there's a lot of opportunity, but it, it's still a bit scary for a lot of, a lot of uh, people we talk to. Yeah, so, so actually what we are doing is we are holding a lot of workshops with our clients for them to understand exactly what is the impact of the new DeFi type of, of economy. Right? So if you look at, okay, so how we talk to clients is that um, whatever we are doing for digital asset custody, for tokenization, actually I still group them as the traditional side of finance where we are trying to improve the efficiency. Okay, but on the right hand side is where all the new things are, all the DeFi protocols, the lending, the derivative, and and the rest of the new stuff. And, and I group that as the right hand side of things, right? So, um, so for the bank, right, it is about helping the client to have seamless experience across both left hand and right hand side of things, and how how to make both side runs in parallel for the next few years while slowly transiting from the left hand side to the right hand side. Okay, so that's what we have been discussing with with as well. So, so, so for them, some of the asset manager, actually it is easy for them to create, let's say, a fund of NFTs, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But most of the buy side, they are not looking into investing into the infrastructure to do this, right? So that's where we are actually playing a role to, to invest in the infrastructure that will enable the asset manager to come in to create the funds and of NFT or the funds of derivative or whatever that they are trying to do in, in the right-hand side space. Okay, so that's the role that we have been trying to educate uh, the client that we can help you with. Yeah. Okay. And, and if we sort of play that a bit, you mentioned obviously the traditional services that, you know, the custody, sort of fund accounting um, and the like, and clearly clients are looking at doing more. So you're helping educate them, but what other services do you, you know, are, are you looking to provide today and it's sort of in that roadmap? Because again, I think that's interesting in terms of, you know, what, what clients can potentially, uh, you know, what services they can pick up from a traditional player versus, um, we'll come to Hassan in a second and, and sort of uh, compare and contrast. Yeah, so 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 right now, I think for, for the next few months, right, our focus is really to uh, launch our digital asset custody service as well as uh, our tokenization service as well. So we have been doing a lot of, um, experiments with uh, uh, with the regulator, etc. So I think the technology is at a stage of maturity that we are able to launch it quite safely, uh, actually very safe for our clients to get involved in all these type of digital asset. But again, right, those um, the custody and the tokenization, I will see that as the fundamentals of what we need to provide to make the traditional finance more more efficient. Okay, so at the same time, right, we are doing a, a lot of experiment across the bank. To look at Web three type of technology, which which means that we are working with um, some of the um, uh, fintech provider to see how we can play a role in connecting our client to the DeFi space, and how do we actually help in creating some of the um, potential product and services. So if you look at the D the DeFi space, right, there's a few category of product and services that's up and coming. So the first one is lending and credit, the second one is derivative. The third one is um, decentralized exchange. And last but not least is the composite token type of concept. So if you look at the composite token, it is actually a token that holds other token. So from a portfolio perspective, it actually if it functions like a fund or a portfolio. So that is where um, we, we, we are trying to see whether a composite token can actually help us in some of these uh, structuring of products and services with our clients. Excellent. Thanks again. Maybe Hassan, just a bit quickly back to you. Um, I know when we're talking to clients, we talk a lot about the op model. We talk about obviously custody first and foremost, but, you know, getting the comfort, but there's also a lot of questions that come up about, well, what about staking? What about yield farming? You know, what, what do you see in terms of, particularly if we think about some of those institutional clients, what, what services are they looking for? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's, it's all about um, safety and security. And, and making sure that uh, you know the assets that they're custodying are, are you know sort of deep assurance that you know they, they will be protected. 
uh, you know, as sort of the largest uh, crypto custodian in the world, we're very, you know, proud to kind of stand behind that promise. I think uh, beyond that, in terms of sort of value added features, you know, one kind of consistent theme is how to make assets more productive. So I think it's it's uh, good that they're they're sort of there and, and uh, preserved, but you know services like staking or being able to participate in protocol issuance uh, and revenue and being able to uh, in exchange and governance and uh, network security uh, are all uh, we're we're finding that institutions are getting surprisingly sophisticated about asking these qu questions proactively as they're getting more and more educated about the space and different kinds of uh, you know network and consensus design. Uh, and other sort of uh, just more kind of you know traditional aspects of you know being able to uh, get prime brokerage services, uh, you know financing against trades and just general execution given the bracket. Um, those pretty per perennial topics um, you know that that come up. Uh, and then I think going back to NFT, it's this is the question we're getting these days of you know do, um, do you uh, sort of uh you know useful in one cool thanks Hassan. i'm conscious we're, we're coming to the end i think we've had a very good uh discussion today so perhaps for all three panelists um given the market is maturing and evolving at a, a, a crazy rate if we look three years out um let, let's give me sort of 60 seconds um we'll start with oye three years out um what is going to be the biggest difference to today's digital assets landscape from your perspective so oye uh, a view of the future yeah, I think that regulation will evolve very rapidly. I think the governments are getting their game together, um, presumably in a more regulated way rather than a less regulated way. And, and so I think the positioning there for uh, traditional banks and certainly platforms like ourselves are watching this with a lot of interest. With that regulation, it either goes both ways, right? It either squeezes the, the market extremely or it actually allows a further flourishing of the innovation in the space. So I'm obviously hoping for the latter rather than the former. Okay, so opportunity or a threat. Excellent. Um, Hassan, from your perspective, three years out, what are we going to be looking at? I think my, my dark horse bet is that there's going to be one country uh, or jurisdiction that's going to take a very uh, sort of deep bet uh, on Web3 and it's going to pay off uh, in huge spades, uh, just like how sort of you know e-money and fintech you know have to kind of leapfrog maybe traditional kind of bank branches. Uh, I think Web3 will be a source of huge FDI, huge um, sort of economic uh, kind of you know improvement uh, for for consumers, and it's going to be stood up as a model. Uh, for other countries, and and my bet is it's going to be from the global south. You don't you don't want to hazard which countries? No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> one for next time. I'll leave. I'll leave. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that one till next time. Uh, Zk, uh, last comment yeah. from you. Three years out. Sure, sure, sure. So I think trying to imagine a radically different future is often quite difficult, right? But I think uh, I think the regulators are already taking steps to put in place some guidance, and I think in three years' time. There should be more uh, regulatory clarity in the digital asset space, right? So, in terms of DLT applications, three years ago we probably didn't expect NFT to take the market by storm. Okay, so three years down the road, right? I think we will see even more innovation, especially in the areas of lending, derivative, and decentralized trading. And the new innovation that we are seeing today, right, will likely then become the mainstream. Okay, so I will end by borrowing a quote from from Carlota Perez. The possibilities of radical innovation are often difficult to envisage until the appropriate paradigm is in place. Okay, so it will be interesting to see what's the next big thing in the digital asset ecosystem. Fantastic. Um, food for thought. I think we've all got some homework here and uh, lots more to discuss. I'd like to thank um, Hassan, ZK, and Oyi for joining me today. A really good conversation. I hope we can continue again. Uh, one day in the future. So thank you once again. I'm going to close this session. I'm going to pass over to my colleague Roy. He's going to be talking about CDBC, um, particularly from a China-specific viewpoint. Um, thank you once again, everybody, for joining us. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you and have a good afternoon ahead. Over to you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, welcome back again. So this panel in the next 30 minutes will, will be around uh, central bank digital currency, which is CBDC. Uh, as we all know, uh, China is one of the leaders in this area. So together with two 
guest panelists, we will give you the China viewpoint on CBDC. Um, my name is Roy Liu, I'm the moderator for this panel. I'm the guy. So part of my time is also based in, uh, based in Shenzhen. So uh, together with two of my uh, uh, guest hosts, uh, I will introduce uh, did anyone can hear me and uh, is Ifan and Jaji is also online so did anyone can anyone have any problem to see okay cool oh can yeah see me? okay good yeah, yeah I can hear you nice and clear so I apologize for that so while we're waiting for the the, the final guest speaker I will introduce uh, Ifan first so uh, he is the uh, founder of BSN, and then uh, he's uh, one of the pioneer and expert for blockchain and CBDC development in China. So uh, while we're waiting, Ifan, do you give us a quick introduction for yourself and your company before we start the main session? Okay, uh, thank you, Roy. Uh, my name is Yifan Yifan He, and uh, I'm the CEO and the founder of Red Day Technology. Uh, Red Day Technology is basically is uh, one of the founding members of the project we call uh, blockchain-based service network uh, BSN. So we uh, uh, what we do basically is building infrastructures, you know, to make uh, uh, blockchain technology and the NFT technology much easier to access and much cheaper. So we don't actually build any applications; uh, we just focus on the infrastructure. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yifan. Okay, so uh, as we all seen, there are many plans introducing central bank digital currency and CBDC is gaining lots of momentum in the global banks, uh, in all the central banks globally. And based on the IMF report, there are around 100 countries exploring CBDCs at one level or another. Some country was doing the research some is doing testing, and there are a few already, uh, you know, distributing CBDC to public. So, what is the key trend for CBDC globally? You have observed and is worth mentioning. So, is there anything you're willing to share? <laughs> so, so first, I want to uh, uh, make a one point first. It's uh, we have always need, uh, you know, uh, to make sure we understand those two categories. One is the security like cryptocurrency, and the one is payment related digital currency. Those two are totally two different categories. We cannot make them. Uh, when we make them, there's nothing to talk about. It, uh, it's all messed up. So, so, uh, but, uh, but, but personally, I think, you know, with uh, the, you know, uh, uh, blockchain technology and the, the decentralized uh, concept become more and more uh, popular. So it, uh, I think central bank digital currency will be you know, uh, it's basically non-stop, you know, it, it will move forward, uh, you know, some country probably take uh, three to five years, some country takes 10 years, some country probably don't even do a central bank their digital currency, but they regulate the, the commercial banks to issue stable coins. So there's different ways, but that's, uh, but this is only starting point for the payment related digital currency. Because right now what we see is basically everything is security like, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. So I, uh, I think, I think that's uh, the the train is definitely non-stop. Okay, sure, definitely. And, and currently in China, so the digital RMB, what we call is uh, initially what we call BTC, and then uh, the DCEP, and now it's called e Chinese Yuan. Is continue to progress, and we see there are currently hundred million individuals are using the the digital e Chinese Yuan. And also billions of yuan is in transaction. Uh, personally, myself, I'm I'm register uh, app and using DCP wallet already, and I'm paying my uh, uh, taxi bills and I'm paying in the convenience stores. So, w w and, and what is the key function and features for e Chinese yuan card? Can you maybe give audience a brief introduction? And also. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I will touch on the functionality, especially for the privacy and smart contract. B before, you know, Paul is sharing his vision. So he said, central bank digital currency are mainly have three major, you know, default, uh, three major barriers. Number one is not decentralized. Number two is can't guarantee privacy. Number three, the most of the CBDCs not apply uh, smart contracts, not programmable. So in this case, 
uh, what is the 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 e Chinese yuan do you know in this field? Uh, personally, I like uh, e Chinese yuan. I think uh, uh, from a technical perspective, uh, because I think the design is uh, is uh, pretty good at this stage. Uh, first, uh, personally, I, I have different views with Paul. Okay, it's uh, uh, personal. I think uh, almost all the central bank digital currency from major countries will be centralized as uh, at least uh, how to issue in the, the the digital currency. It will be centralized and even. Uh, you know, a, a, even it's decentralized, it will be a permission the limited decentralized uh, structure. Uh, and and uh, no central bank digital currency will use public chain, okay? It's uh, because it's your solving money. You don't want to just move your solving money and you pay a tax to a third party. It won't happen. It won't happen whatsoever. So, uh, but uh, I think right now the, the, the Chinese Yuan, right now, if as an individual, we use it, it's no difference from regular bank account and the regular WeChat Pay or, or Alipay. It's no different from, but back end, it's actually the, the, uh, the PBOC is building a very massive system to handle, you know, probably half million TPS uh, 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 in the future. So, uh, and the only centralized system can handle that kind of TPS, okay? Blockchain can't. Uh, uh, but, but I think the most important thing right now is, you know, it, 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 it's actually two sides. It, it's good, it's also bad. Uh, because right now it's uh, for the uh, Chinese digital yuan, if you want to use it, you have to go through commercial banks. Okay, so so uh, with this, this kind of structure, actually actually the, the, the Chinese digital yuan lose most of the benefits of you know a central bank digital currency but it's safe okay which means the central bank doesn't compete with commercial bank directly i mean if the central bank you know uh, release uh, uh, app uh, app everybody download the app use use that and connect to the central bank directly they basically competing with all the commercial banks but uh, right now uh, uh, you, you just mentioned you download the app but within that app Right. Uh, if you choose, you need to choose a bank. So when you choose a bank, that app actually connect to the bank, not the central bank. So so basically, it's a banking uh, app. Uh, but but I think I think uh, at this stage, you know, we are still testing the entire the system. The commercial bank, you know, is trying to understand the digital currency. At this stage, this is actually the right way to do. I, I think most the central bank will do the same. But the, but the eventually. Eventually, the central bank digital currency must bypass commercial bank. So, which means all the model settlement will be happened within one system. It will be much faster, much quicker, and people and the companies can own their money in their wallet, not in a special commercial bank account. So, I, I think eventually the, the, the Chinese yuan will move that way. But now it's still within the commercial bank. Okay, fully understand. Yeah, we all know, you know, for the double layer system currently designed in China, it will be helping the the financial stability and especially the disintermediary for the for the for, for, for the commercial bank for sure. And do do you foresee, uh, for example, you know, any smart contract will apply on on, on the e Chinese yuan or any central bank digital currency? I I see the the president from uh. For, from from P, PBOC, they mentioned they might have some uh, you know anti money laundry type of you know smart contract application in place in the future. Is there anything any commercially uh, adopt uh, smart contract will be available for CBD uh, for China CBDC in future? Uh, uh, you just mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Chinese Union has two uh, two layer system. I think uh, even the, if there will be a smart contract, it will be on the second layer, on the commercial bank layer, and uh, the commercial bank will build by themselves, you know, build uh, some kind of permission chain and and uh, uh, de uh, deploy deploy a smart contract to handle part of the money as an application. So a one a, a personal, I don't think the digital yuan mainframe will handle smart contract. I, uh, personal, I don't, I, I don't think so. And and uh, even it has smart contract, it won't open source. Okay, if it won't open source under the chain is permission, it's a still centralized system. So it's uh, meaningless. Uh, 
uh, even with smart contract. Okay. okay, understand. So currently, for for the 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 China version, CBDC is only replacing M zero. We know it's like the lonesome cash. And then, do you see in the future will start adopt in the B two B section? So for the business transactions and for global trade areas. So is there any practice currently uh, with BSN is doing? in something uh, like preparation or what will you try to do in this area? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I, I, uh, personally, I think, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, foreign individual and the foreign company can use digital yuan, I, I think it will take probably, you know, three to five years, even 10 years. And just imagine how you even open accounts in Singapore, not the US, even in Singapore, how you even open accounts. It will, it will involve the both Central banks they will involve to building a massive IT system within the Singapore. So it's it's very very complicated. So, but I think uh, 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 in 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 probably one or two years you will see the business within China to your state of yuan to you know basically move into you know the the not only M zero. So so uh, so I I think in two years you probably will see that you know doing transaction, but it still goes through commercial bank. You cannot say my company holds uh, accounts directly with central bank and I wear the money within the central bank zero currency says to another company, bypass all the commercial bank. I think, I, uh, I think that will happen probably in a much longer time. Okay, I understand and that. And you know, so for CB, DC, we know they have some barriers, but you know we do see stablecoin will be maybe one of the the, the game changers. And however, for stablecoin, as Paul mentioned before, the regulatory uncertainty for stablecoin is still very high, but we hmm. do see some uh, breakthroughs. So for for example, for last year, the OCC approved the use of stablecoin in banking transactions in USA. Hmm. So hmm. for both stablecoin uh, and CBDC, what level of disruption will bring into the financial system in, in, in maybe say two year to two to three years time? Okay, so uh, so basically first, uh, uh, I still go back to my two categories. Stablecoin is a payment related uh, digital currency, not a cryptocurrency, you know, as a security. So personal, I like stablecoins. You know, it's uh, I, I, I think a central bank digital currency will be more centralized, you know, more, you know, sovereign, you know, governed. Uh, so it's, uh, I think stablecoin is much flexible, but the problem is the regulation. So uh, because even in the US, we say the USDC, you know, also USDT, we, you know, we know there's some issues. So there's no clear regulation right now. Uh, personally, I think some country, probably even US, they won't issue central bank digital currency, but they will have a very, very strict regulation there and they encourage financial institutions to issue their stable coins. Then those stable coins can even on public chain because it's not sovereign money. You know, it's as a commercial bank, you, you know, your user pay a gas fee, it's fine. So uh, uh, I think I think the stable coin will be much, much flexible. I think in the next five years, we, we probably see hundreds of stable coins. Uh, uh, um, but most of them, I think, uh, will be initially will be used in the closed system, you know, permission chain between, you know, commercial banks to do settlements, to do, you know, transfers, you know, probably bypass SWIFT, something like that. So uh, I, I think in two or three years, we can see a lot of this kind of, you know, activities. But the stablecoin is really, really, it's, uh, you know, with central bank digital currency, those two, uh, I think in 10 years, we will change the entire financial industry and the commercial world. Uh, uh, personally, I think, uh, you know, with uh, digital currency, uh, for example, for some very large company like Apple, they, they, they can hold all their money in, you know, thousands of wallets, and they can build a system to manage their money without a commercial bank. So then they become bank. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, regulation allows, then they become bank. They can give credit, you know, to uh, to their customers, give loans to their supplier, and manage everything. You know, within their system. So that's that will be very very powerful. I mean, even some individual can run a small bank. <laughs> you know, to run a small financial services. You know, if regulation allows. 
Okay, yeah. And one of the area I realized for, for CBDC developing uh, is uh, global trade. And we know mm -hmm. currently there are many clients of us, of, of EY China, is they, they uh, inquire and find some solution to solve the global trade and, and uh, global trade issues. And, and is there any practice BSN or you observe, you know, China entity try to solve by using blockchain or a stable coin or CBDC in terms of global trade? And maybe tell us a little bit more about the, the initiative uh, BSN try to participate in terms of the Shenzhen mm -hmm. and, and Singapore Smart City, Smart City okay. initiative. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, we actually, uh, that's a POC project. Uh, we basically build a three blockchain based uh, database okay we uh, the data center we, we actually call that data center uh, one in Shenzhen, one in Chongqing, and one in singapore so and the link those three cities together uh, become a small network with the three uh, you know blockchain based uh, data centers then within those three data centers you can deploy any kind of you know blockchain technology you can build your own permission chain and even from Singapore side, you can access the Ethereum as a public chain to deploy, for example, the bill of landing uh, on, on Ethereum. And in China, we build permission chains within this closed network, for example, physical because also bill of landing. And those two can talk to each other. So, so, so foreign companies from Singapore, they, they, uh, they, they create their NFT, you know, bill of landing on Ethereum, and uh, the Chinese company can get them into China legally and uh, to verify it and uh, passing within China in a permission environment. So that's basically what we're trying to try to bridge really, really seamlessly to bridge the, the permission chain and the public chain. Because in China, not only cryptocurrency is illegal, running a public chain node is also illegal because it's against the internet regulation for KYC and also content management. Understand. Uh, apart from CBDC, you do mention NFT as well, and the previous panel was also mentioned NFT. We know NFT. Uh, so there are also like uh, mass adoption applications, including digital art and collectibles, uh, avatars, something like that. But apart from that, is there any new initiative for like the corporate adoption for NFT, especially like in the global trade scenario you mentioned before, uh, I, I, what's the relationship between NFT and CBDCs in the B2B field? So anything, any insight you want to share? So uh, uh, the reason we, you know, personally, I really love the blockchain technology and the NFT technology because we, I see them as technology not an application. So like art, art collectibles is an application. So uh, when we talk about NFT, it's purely, no, it's, it's purely the, the uh, technology. So blockchain technology, why it's beautiful? Because it's a shared environment. It's a, you know, it's not like everybody is building their data within their backend, no one can access. Now basically they move some data without personal information into a shared environment. Everybody can access our so, so in the future, any IT system has two databases. One is backend database, one is a shared decentralized database. It's blockchain technology. And NFT on blockchain is basically a tiny object database. So, 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 so uh, 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 personally, I think in the future, uh, let's say not three for five years, let's say 20 years. All the account management, for example, Facebook, Taobao, those big, big websites, they won't, they no longer store their personal, their user information, privacy information to their back end system. They will, instead, they will call a, a private key managed, private key managed NFT in a, in a shared environment. So, so each user can use their own private key to protect the data they link to their NFT account. For example, facial recognition data. I mean, today in China, Taobao, uh, when you use your facial recognition data to basically make a payment, right? The street, they, they let you confirm. They let you confirm. My question is technically without confirmation, can they process? <laughs> of course they can process. <laughs> they don't need your confirmation, it's politely asked for. But if we build all our accounts 
on a shared environment as an NFT. Then we link our uh, facial recognition data with this NFT, with our per, uh, private key, and then no one can access it without our consent. So, so, so that's why uh, blockchain technology, NFT technology will change the entire IT infrastructure. So, so this is very, very important. Let's not only talk about some art collectibles, okay? It's, it's, it's basic and, and even cryptocurrency. It's, it's, it's the most simple, simplest application can be built with NFT and blockchain technology. It's just like an email for the internet, right? Send a text to another server and decode it and show you in your face. It's most simple application. It, it will involve and then the really, really change the world. Okay, I understand. So uh, what is the NFT or even Web3 trend in, in China? Is China missing out the opportunity in NFT and Web3? Because you know we know NFT is major build on the uh, public uh, blockchain and then it's the, the, <laughs> a good level of decentralization. So do, do, do you think China missing out the opportunity for no, we, we, we just, and then the uh, development of CBDC will help to 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 cover it up. Uh, uh, we are not missing anything. We just miss the opportunity of speculation. Okay, <laughs> we cannot speculate legally with cryptocurrency in China. We just miss that. So so nothing else, because we don't have that kind of speculation. So that's why all the companies in China focus on the enterprise. Uh, 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 applications and the solutions. So uh, I think uh, uh, I think you will show this year, next year, and uh, two years later, in three years, you will see a lot of improvement and advance of blockchain technology, NFT technology from China. Okay, Th this is actually the benefit of not having cryptocurrency because everybody focuses on the technology and the real utility use cases. Yeah, I understand. So back on the uh, CBDC. So what uh, what industry or what company will first will be the first adopter for for CBDC uh, related applications? Uh, apart from financial industries, is there any other like industry or company will adopt uh, CBDC related uh, applications? Uh, it, uh, it's really it depends on uh, what kind of application you talk about. If it's mm -hmm. still make a payment, I mean, right now, if you go to some restaurant, you can basically process that from their, mm -hmm. you know, cell phone or post machines. So, so, mm -hmm. uh, but if you mean, if you mean when, you know, you can build a smart contract and put on a commercial bank a permission chain and directly handle money, handle the digital yuan from that smart contract. I, personal, personally, I think the, the, the first set of application will come from bank. Okay, then it really depends on how bank allow users IT system to access their, you know, smart contract. So, so that uh, I, the personalized this will take a year, take a year. Yeah, fully agree with your point. So currently as a public CBDC user in China, I feel it's no different by using a, <laughs> a CBDC to doing payment or any or using Alipay or WeChat Pay to doing payment or even using cash. So it's not much different by in in the payment area. And then you point try to say is you know in the B two B section, uh, the only thing we can make, uh, you know, make the, the 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 application more unique or irreplaceable is you know by working with the bank and you get access to their smart contract for, for CBDC, is that right? Uh, really, uh, really, right now, I think even in China, let's talk, let's not talk about the, you know, the, the user experience because it's not point for now. Now is actually to come up a new idea how to build a, a central bank digital currency system. I think the, the PBOC actually is testing all the scenarios, try to design, because this is the first functioning Central bank digital currency system from a major country. So, so th this is totally new, even for them. So they are still testing, you know, explore all the possibilities, and and uh, working with commercial bank, get the feedback from a commercial bank, and and how to handle that better. So, so right now, actually, the focus is on how to building a foundation for the future. Mm -hmm. Digital currency now it's yeah. not really. I mean, 
they don't even push for for the for the user you know experience of uh, uh, number of users yeah fully understand yeah like we're, if we are in the internet year and we talk about still building the infrastructure but you know you can't imagine how the uber or airbnb app will be looks like you exactly know, maybe, exactly in five ten years they need to evolve and grow so fully yeah. understand your point and and the, the last point you know last year the ex president of uh, people bank of china Zhou Xiaochuan, he mentioned you know if there is anything he wants to do for the uh, interoperability or cross-border cbdc application he will recommend maybe Singapore and, and, and China in the tourist uh, scenarios, they may be using the, the cross-border CBDC exchange or something like that. So uh, do you foresee anything, you know, in the, in not only CBDC testing in one country will be, you know, CBDC cross-border and, and for multiple countries. Do, do you foresee that happening? Uh, personally, I think uh, if 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 uh, the system is like today, it will just like WeChat and Alipay in overseas. The merchant basically go to a Chinese bank's branch, Singapore branch, open a uh, account so they can accept uh, 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 accept the the digital yuan. But that means the the, the central bank of Singapore will allow it. The the, the Singapore you know the monetary authority will allow that. So uh, that's why in the beginning I said you know for 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 digital yuan move out of China is actually extremely difficult because the even the Chinese bank's branch in Singapore is is governed not by the PBOC by the the, the Singapore money monetary authority. So uh, that's why it's uh, it's uh, uh, first the central bank will allow it uh, and uh, and also just imagine this how the digital currency can circulate in that country where they get that those currencies so so uh, i think uh, uh, the the process will be like this two central bank need to sign agreement and uh, the singapore monetary authority need to buy the digital yuan from chinese central bank and uh, probably they use singapore dollar but uh, the chinese uh, central bank will say okay sorry we just Accept the U.S. dollar, <laughs> okay, something like that. Then they buy, they basically put the money into the PBOC and buy the, the digital yuan to Singapore, and they still need to build the infrastructure there. They need, uh, you know, all the uh, commercial bank to 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 uh, be able to process digital yuan, and all the merchants, all the individual companies. That's that's billion dollar investment. So so that's why I think this is will take a while and. Uh, Eventually, probably it's only like a WeChat and the Ali pay today. You know, just some merchant can, can accept them and immediately convert to their local currency, something like that. Okay, yep. Thank you, Ifan. And it's probably to the end of the session. We all know there are many central banks that are rolling up their sleeves and, and doing innovation in CBDC, but like what you introduced, even in China, is still like very early stage. Age, we're still building the infrastructure but you know this is to me this is still like the uh, application for the leaders and innovators to to worth attention in this field is there any like uh, uh, future trend prediction you want to say in the next one or two uh, one, one or two years say if leader want to watch in the cbdc field which area particularly they should you know still focus on in this in, in related in cbdc uh in two years it's too short uh i think i think okay. in two years uh, there will not be a major change probably probably some limited very limited anonymous accounts okay probably one thousand mm -hmm. uh, uh yuan or something like that but you still probably need to provide your phone number okay <laughs> something like that within china and uh, yeah. uh, and i think in two years they will enable business to business transfer okay but uh, but uh, okay. it's probably still very small amount but uh, not a major amount so uh, and they will testing you know something it's uh, for the foreign uh, uh, merchant uh, it will start from hong kong for sure okay after covid uh, from hong kong okay. there will cool. be some merchant can accept you know digital yuan but within a chinese bank Branch, Hong Kong branch, okay. and, the, and and even that, even that, Hong, uh, Hong you, Kong Dan. Monetary Authority will sign an agreement with the central bank. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for your time, and thank you for all the audience. And I'll pass 
the, the time next to my colleague, Rick. So hand it over to you, Rick. Thank you for everyone. Thanks, Roy. Hi, everyone. My name's Rick, and we're now at that point where we'll be transitioning the afternoon sessions to key industry trends and EY platforms and products. But before we do that, I encourage everyone to get out their smartphones and please scan the QR code so that you can get your own minted proof of attendance protocol NFT and add it to your digital wallet. So for some of you, this might be your first time to own an NFT, so it's a really good process to go through. Our next session uh, is the metaverse, a very exciting topic that smashes together a number of emerging technologies with a great panel to talk about use cases in real life. So Magnus, over to you. Thank you, Rick. My name is Magnus Jones. I am the Nordic Blockchain and Innovation Lead at EUI. I'm based in Oslo, Norway, but also working with clients and stakeholders all over the world with everything from tax and legal challenges to ecosystem, tokenomics questions, etc. I've also had the pleasure of assisting some of the world's largest brands on their metaverse and NFT projects, including also authorities to whom we have with us on the panel today. In addition, we also have two other great future thinking minds who is deep in the landscape of metaverse. So it is with great pleasure to welcome Susanna Bastian, the CEO and founder of uh, Javels. Susanna and the tech team, have we managed to connect the rest of the panel here? Yeah, I think so. Perfect, Susanna. <laughs> Welcome. Please hello give us a, a 30 second intro about yourself. Yeah, so hello, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. Uh, my name is Susanna Bastion. Uh, I am the founder of Jevels, uh, which is the NFT platform dedicated to virtual jewelry and fashion accessories wearable through augmented and virtual realities. Uh, I'm originally a pharmacist, but I've always wanted to contribute to the fashion industry, becoming more sustainable, inclusive, and creative. And uh, late 2020, when I fixed my sister, I discovered the concepts of digital fashion and, and virtual worlds, and that I wanted to combine these into what is Devils today. Perfect. Thank you, Susanna. Together with us is also uh, Andreas uh, Hamnes from the Norwegian Business Entity Register. Also, 30 seconds about yourself, Andreas. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, um, for having me, uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm um, an innovation lead at the business, uh, Norwegian Business uh, Registries, and I have a 15 plus years of uh, public sector innovation experience. I've led uh, successful cross-sector governmental innovation programs during these years. I hosted the first public sector blockchain hackathon four years ago and currently a project manager of a public Ethereum infrastructure project on behalf of the national business registries. I am uh, what you can say a pro metaverse, pro decentralization and optimistic about the journey ahead of us. So, so again, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Sounds good on us. We're looking forward. And last but not least, we have David Garner uh, from Centaurify. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me at this uh, great event. It's been very interesting so far. Uh, yeah, I'm David Garner. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer at a company called Centurify. Uh, we're building a web free business service for musicians to on ramp onto web free uh, environments and utilize NFT technology. And uh, yeah, I've been involved in blockchain for the past four years, uh, co-founded the blockchain uh, group uh, with together with Magnus Jones here uh, with the Norwegian Data Association. And I've been involved in basically all aspects of blockchain for the, yeah, for the past four years and worked with IT uh, for the past 13. Perfect. Thank you, David. As you can hear, we have an amazing competence in the panel here together with us today. And they are going to give us their insights in a world that might seem totally new to many. We've heard from previous speakers and talks today briefly about it, but what is it actually? Is it all about these virtual lands that are suddenly selling for a higher value than real property in the real world? And what is it about this landscape that Morgan Stanley predicts to become an 8 trillion US dollar market in Asia alone. 
And is this just the emperor's new clothes and a hype or the emperor's new virtual clothes? Well, that we will hear from the panelists. But as an introduction to the topic, bear in mind what we also heard from several of the other speakers that metaverse is linked towards just a natural development of the internet. We are now in the process of moving from what we heard here from web two to the so-called web three, i.e. going from read and write functionalities on platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, etc. And these web two platforms, they store all your data in centralized databases. And these large tech corporations also own all content, including the data that you have provided. While with web three, we are still having the functionalities of read and write, but also the ability to own and to transfer those values between us without intermediaries by using the blockchain as a safe, decentralized and transparent system to exchange ownership, money and information. And a key element to provide, to prove ownership on a blockchain is the so-called NFTs, the non-fungible tokens that we heard lots of talk about here today. And many of you might know them as a relation towards crypto art and the crypto punks and all, or these apes that are being traded for millions of dollars. However, NFTs can be used for much more than speculation only. So starting off with you, David, could you please tell us a little bit more about how you guys at Centurify is using NFTs at your music platform and why you're using NFTs? Yeah, sure. So to start off with, um, the whole central idea behind Centurify is to empower musicians. Um, what does that mean? Well, uh, today there's a lot of centralized uh, large uh, companies that are basically own uh, the ticketing market. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys follow John Oliver, but he had a very interesting, funny sort of uh, uh, segment on that a couple of days ago uh, and how that's affecting the market. But basically what it means is that uh, artists uh, are, they have centralized middlemen that are involved in their business processes uh, that are taking large revenue, but not giving much value back to the market, neither to the artists or the fans. So the idea we had was, uh, could we create a platform that enabled uh, musicians to basically do what cryptocurrencies are meant to do for value transactions between people, but do that with uh, a, a more complex level of business. So in this sense, ownership. And like has been mentioned before, um, NFT technologies are uh, a, very, a very good technology to uh, utilize that type of uh, ownership transaction. So what we're doing is we're building um, an NFT uh, music-based web free platform that will allow musicians to sell uh, merchandise and tickets directly to fans. So you, you cut out a lot of the middlemen transactions. And what? why is this important for the metaverse? Well, the, there, are, there are a number of reasons. Number one is that the, the metaverse uh, has a, a lot of interesting potential for musicians. So uh, live music is basically what musicians make most of their money from, live performances. About 80% of their income comes from that. And a lot of that is determined by the their ability to travel, their ability to actually be at the event. COVID-19 showed you how vulnerable these types of uh, businesses are to um, shutdowns and stuff like this. And with the metaverse or metaverses, um, you basically eradicate a lot of these uh, limitations and basically allow for much more, uh, a higher form for scalability for those types of businesses. Um, and this also is uh, something that's very important for the metaverse because as you were saying, the metaverse is uh, what you could say is the uh, user interface layer of Web3. It's where we're going to be interacting more with Web3 types of technology. And one important part of the metaverse is that it's a visual layer, I would say. So you have uh, the internet today as it is, which is uh, read and write. Um, and that it, it's sort of a two-dimensional interaction. But with the metaverse, you have a potential to have increased um, the visual application of it through three-dimensional graphics and obviously VR and stuff like this, but also the sound. And we see that musicians having um, the ability to use a, a type of service provider that can connect to different types of metaverses 
is a much better solution than each metaverse creating its own ticketing and um, NFT marketplace for these musicians. So that's basically what we're doing and how we see us interacting with the metaverse. Fascinating. Very interesting, David. And Susanna, you are also using NFTs as a proof of ownership towards your products. Tell us a bit more about about what you're doing, how they work, and the role of NFTs within your ecosystem. Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, David uh, is empowering musicians. Uh, we are empowering uh, designers. Um, and as you say, ownership uh, is a key element of Web3. It's not read and write anymore. It's read, write, and own. Um, However, owning an, a digital asset is entirely new for most of us, right? Uh, an article by Forbes came out last week stating that 15% uh, of wardrobe uh, will be digital in future, uh, which is a lot considering the apparel industry is worth 800 billion USD today. So imagine you buy something you want to own and wear, but it exists uh, digitally only. And how does it work uh, now? Um, so uh, the big advantage of the blockchain is that the ownership of these digital assets can be validated and stored decentrally. Um, and this is also how our uh, platform works. Uh, Javels has developed its own smart contracts uh, that communicate with the Ethereum blockchain. And this means um, that all virtual jewelry um, on our platform uh, and all designs uh, are validated as NFTs. They are available in limited quantities predefined through the blockchain and each transaction of ownership is verified in this, this big system. So when a person decides to purchase his NFT on our platform, the ownership is transmitted to his crypto wallet, like with all NFTs and it's stored there. And then this design can be showcased uh, on public uh, platforms and being traded uh, with other platforms and with other um, NFT owners. <clears throat> so the data, as you say before, it's not merely stored on a cloud of a big corporation like Google and Facebook. Um, and this makes all the difference because it ensures traceability and resolves all questions when it comes to, for instance, copyright disputes. Um, and above that, uh, we are working on making every NFT, every virtual we on our platform wearable in various uh, virtual environments, but I believe that we are going to talk about this in a moment, right? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And Andreas, when you hear these uh, decentralized elements, uh, I would like to hear a bit more from your side at the government. You are you are for sure not just making JPEGs of thing to, to create some NFTs, but you're rather building a very interesting and, and I would say personally future thinking platform with <laughs> regards to digitizing the shareholder register and putting that all into the public Ethereum mainnet blockchain. Tell us a bit more about this and, and why you are doing this, putting it onto a public blockchain versus a centralized systems and benefits, challenges towards this one. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm happy to tell you about that. But first, I, I just have to say about uh, Susanna, your background, it, it's beautiful. And I, I wonder if, uh, if, if you were in my town, hometown last night, because we had exactly that northern light uh, <laughs> sky uh, just before I woke up uh, pretty early today. Thank you, Magnus. <laughs> but anyway, yes, we'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about what we are building. Uh, you also asked me a little bit about, uh, little bit about uh, uh, public uh, Ethereum mainnet versus uh, centralized, but we'll see if I, I cover that. But I think that we are actually building a fundamental building block uh, for both the digital and the virtual world, because we, we are actually uh, creating a cap table infrastructure for unlimited companies. And this, apply, this applies for approximately, let's say 90% of our, our uh, uh, national companies or let's call it market. This potentially allows for what we call full-time, uh, real-time transparency and real-time trades for enlisted shares. Uh, and as a basic for, also a basic for real-time uh, management, for example, taxation, update our business registers um, through direct transaction harvesting, 
versus what we traditionally do when we, uh, we have traditional reporting into, into the government. Um, the key here is that the, the share itself is being treated as a token, which is not much different from an uh, NFT. And this uh, infrastructure lays, uh, the way we see it, uh, the grant for equal access for an opportunity for, for innovation and uh, for existing and new businesses. Uh, and we're also looking for cross-border uh, actions in time, though, uh, not at this moment. But we see that uh, using, um, I'll explain more about that, but first let, we can talk about um, some of the benefits. Uh, we hope to create uh, value because we simplify the, the compliance and the, gov the corporate governance, but mainly also we lowering transaction costs. And in that uh, space, uh, we will improving the allocation of capital. And I believe that using such a decentralized system to establish a common truth uh, about ownership, uh, which also you, you, you guys are saying that the, the, one of the main things with Web3 is that the, the right to, to own thing. But the, uh, the, the ownership information where the companies themselves uh, build this change, chain, um, because that they themselves need it uh, to be accurate, uh, this is rewarding. And uh, it also provides, as I said, full transparency in, uh, in such a way it's much more secure, both for potential investors and the company itself. Uh, because, uh, uh, well, we can talk about that later as well. But basically, really short, how we do it there. Uh, I think it's, it's also interesting how we do it uh, technically, because you talked about that we, we use the Ethereum mainnet. Um, so what we actually do is we, we take the Companies Act uh, and, and, and use that into, the, into smart contracts using a defined standard, uh, which, which is specially designed for security assets. Uh, and we use, first we use a layer two, uh, chain Arbitrum to get lower gas fees, the transaction fees, uh, and then we gather this and, and put it on the public uh, Ethereum main chain. Uh, this was one of the biggest issues uh, in the first first time when we talked. We we considered permission versus permissionless uh, blockchain because the cost it was so so expensive, costing like uh, uh, fifty dollars to create a company on the chain it, it just didn't it didn't fly but with layer twos and we see the rise of layer twos as well this is a total different game uh, hopefully uh we will not talk about identity kyc digital wallets uh in this uh, session but we're happy to come back and talk about that later um, but basically this is what we do we create a cap table for all unlisted companies in Norway um, such in such a way that we will get full transparency and investors can be much more secure when they want to invest in Norwegian companies. Yeah, that's basically what we do in a very, very short uh, version. Amazing. Did you get it? Absolutely. I hope the audience also. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's fascinating and, 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 I would give you also credit towards your mindset as an authority to think in these ways, because there's not many that actually does this one. You're caught up in an existing system where you actually don't clearly follow where the world is, is moving. So, so that's absolutely fascinating. So it's great to hear how all of you are, are actually, I would say, far ahead and in the front of the Web3 journey. Uh, which again is, as we have said, the, the heart uh, uh, and the basis of the infrastructure of the metaverse or the metaverses. But if you look into current different versions of metaverse out there, such as some of you might have heard about Decentraland, Sandbox, or gaming versions like Roblox, it seems like we are mainly focusing on virtual lands right now. How do you guys uh, see metaverse evolve? Do you think it will be a virtual playground only, or will we see more of a mixed reality? Going first with you, David, I presume within uh, your metaverse plans at Centurify, you will look into the possibilities of also eventually doing virtual concerts 
uh, with the artists that will come into your portfolios, just like we've seen artists like Ariana Grande, Travis Scott, Justin Bieber has been out there in, in Metaverse already. It actually had audience of, I think it was uh, Travis Scott who had 77 million views just on the, the recap on YouTube afterwards and made around $20 million on selling merch, virtual merch. But, but do you also see a possibility here that you, for example, could uh, have a, a virtual place go in there with your avatar, but actually wear a piece of, of a headset or on, on a flat screen sort of thing to view the concert in HD live. So you're not watching the pixel graphics, but you combining some virtual and the real world. Is that something that you guys are considering? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, we're not going to do it ourselves because that would we think that that's something that uh, a lot of other actors in the in the industry can do and we'll just be providing the web free transaction on ramp between the artist and the uh, person that's going to enjoy the performance or the experience um what i'd like to say though about uh, the metaverse is, is that you know there is a very sort of i would say an unclear from what i've seen at least a very sort of unclear definition of what a metaverse is um my personal uh, opinion on the matter is that um, a virtual world is uh, where you have uh, a defined narrative. So, for example, World of Warcraft or uh, these uh, Fortnites and these types of places. So there's a sorry, defined environment in which uh, players can or users can interact with each other in certain ways. And a metaverse is uh, a place where there is no defined narrative. It's basically up to the users to define the narrative themselves. And, you know, it's the economy and everything else is designed by or um, is created organ organically through the users. Um, and this is an interesting um, thing to think about because how do you then create value in the metaverse? And like you said, you know, most of it's all about properties at the moment. And we think that one of the things you have to do is you have to get businesses into the metaverse but how does a normal business get into the metaverse you know it's like are you going to start doing wormholes are you going to start doing multi-chain uh this is not a no this is not normal questions for a small to medium business uh for most big businesses this is quite these are quite hard questions to answer uh like um andreas was talking about using side chains and stuff to uh, create a more liquid and cost efficient uh, service so what we see, what we're trying to do is um, you, we're trying to create a, a common platform, a web free enabler, like I said before, that allows musicians to basically not have to think about all these things. We create the, the system, they just it's plug and play basically. And then they, uh, through our partner network, um, can then create concerts or do whatever they want to do in, in the metaverse. Uh, but I definitely, to answer, go back to answering your initial question, uh, this is definitely gonna be the way forward. I mean. Um, I've already seen a number of companies doing this. Riot, I've actually, uh, one of the uh, companies in the world that have actually been really looking into doing virtual AR types of concerts. They even have um, a virtual uh, pop group called KDA, for anyone that plays uh, LOL. Uh, raise my hands here a bit. But yeah, yeah they, uh, they, when they've had these sort of uh, uh, world um, tournaments and each tournament they've actually been using these AI technologies to provide a sort of metaversic type of concert uh, thing for fans. So, I mean, people already started doing this. We just need to have the business application in place to make it available for everybody. And that's basically where, where we come in. Absolutely. No, I think you're totally right. And as we see everything from also here within the landscape of football clubs like Manchester City teaming up with Sony, making a virtual stadium, i.e. you could sell out that stadium once, twice, three times, four times, what not infinite, and, and giving the audience the, the impression of actually being there. So for business models, we've seen it at the Atlanta Braves doing it with baseball. We see more and more of these coming in. But that's the mix yeah. of the reality space also. And, and like with you, Susanna, we, if, if some of you have paid attention to, to Susanna's picture, uh, she is actually doing the, the mixed reality right now because you are wearing some nice earrings there. And if you look close to them, you can see that it's, it's pretty hard actually to tell on the small picture whether or not they're real or not, but they're actually uh, virtual. 
And at, 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 what, at what types of platforms do you foresee that the users will wear your virtual jewelry? Can they wear them to, to a concert uh, from, from the music industries or, or at the baseball stadium? Um, maybe, <laughs> that's the great question uh, that we are working with daily. Um, let me start with the augmented reality possibilities. Yeah, as you say, I'm wearing um, virtual earrings right now. I can switch them with um, one click. Um, I can. Um, I switched off the uh, on the background, um, but it's not good. Um, but I switched it on because uh, I have a window which is a little uh, bright in the back. I want to uh, want to see the Nordic lights behind me. I haven't yet, but maybe I have to finish uh, to visit you, Andreas. Yeah. So back to the <laughs> uh, back to the um, um, augmented reality. So this is actually uh, augmented reality uh, in uh, real life. Um, um, we are spending so much time uh, in uh, virtual meetings, and this was the original idea behind uh, Javels. I mean, every day, 650 million people around the world dial in into Zoom, MS Teams, Google Meet. And imagine you can stay in front of the camera in your comfortable clothes and still be dressed professionally with just one click. Um, so wearing digital fashion through augmented reality uh, can really solve this already. And um, yeah, it's um, I can show you with um, more of our designs. Uh, yesterday we had a drop with uh, these beautiful earrings and what is so special about them is that they are animated. So there is a little extra, which you cannot do in real life. Um, in addition, you can dress more sustainably and um, also in a more creative way. Um, yeah, we have also these earrings. So yeah, we have uh, really beautiful designs uh, designed by multiple designers on our website. Um, this was actually the first NFT worn on a live TV broadcast, um, I think ever. <laughs> Uh, it was worn on Yahoo Finance broadcast by one um, NFT expert. That's so great. Um, I think uh, augmented reality is going to um, accompany us uh, for a long time because um, the development uh, with HoloLens and with uh, these mixed reality um, lenses, um, I think this can enhance our um real life or the perception of the real life uh in a in a beautiful and uh yeah amazing way uh, regarding <laughs> yeah. so we, we are a bit short of time here susanna so i'll oh, sorry. just like like to give andreas a, a few words yeah, to, of to, course to yeah. off also but 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 to to illustrate it also I, I couldn't resist it when i went into your website yesterday so i went in and actually bought one myself so uh, I will see if I can switch here now. So you see, I bought the, the, the ETH crown, 0.1 ETH. Um, I'm wearing the NFT right now. Uh, it's, it's the ETH sign up here. You can see it fits perfectly well. So I bet Paul wants this one. It's still a three out of five for, up for grabs there. So, so just go out, watch the website, lots of cool stuff. And I'm looking also forward to that I can actually bring this one in to Metaverse with my avatar and, and use it there. So Andreas, just, just a couple of, of, of last words here also in terms of, uh, of how you see this from the government side. Do you, do you see a, a role of governments going into this landscape, being there, being present, meeting new users or, 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 or in, in a different way teaming up compared to where you sit in, in a centralized world today? Uh, definite, definitely. Uh, uh, this, this, as a metaverse is, uh, okay, let me see. I mean, I, mean, I really get uh, excited and I'm hopeful. I'm looking at you guys and your products and your innovation and, and what you want to, to bring, uh, bring out and how do you, you want to apply your ideas on the web three and, and according to how the, the government should be here. I mean, I think, um, I think the future of how government can add, our role will, would be to, to add trust to legit businesses and services in this landscape. Uh, because as it is, uh, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm always looking for some grown ups in, in this space. <laughs> so so I, I think that sometimes we can, uh, 
level that, that make it a little bit easier. But I feel that it's it's the government our duty to to both simplify the services that we provide and reporting stuff like that, the boring stuff, and also meet our users in the space that they reside, uh, and not the other way around, as it has traditionally been that the government you know is centralized. Now we'll go out and, and try to do our job in a much smoother way, uh, which will give much more trust into this space. Uh, and and I, I, swear, I swear to whatever I can swear to, if I'm allowed to spend tax dollars to, to, to buy and build in, in uh, for example, a sandbox, I will, but, but uh, hopefully, or maybe we'll start with, you know, maybe rent a rental agreement with, uh, with you, Magnus, and your company. Um, because I, I believe areas as education, health, businesses, as you guys have shown, content creation, it's limitless. And, uh, but, but just to have in mind, uh, I think that we, we, we are quite early and we must have yeah. that in mind. Oh, sorry Absolutely. about the time. No, no, no. Absolutely brilliant, yes. Andres. Yeah. And, and you, 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 you dropped a brief teaser there about EY also going into the landscape. So, so we'll see what, what will happen there as well. But, but thank you all for, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, it's been great. And, and as we hear from, from the panel today, Metaverse is much more than just virtual gaming like playgrounds. It is about mixed reality with or without AR, VR goggles and a natural development of the internet moving from 2D to 3D with blockchain and the token economy as underlying infrastructure in order to ensure trust and traceability. So thank you a lot for listening in and back to you, Rick, and the ESG mass adoption. Thanks, Magnus. I really like that crown that you've got um, displaying there. So that was a great purchase. Uh, so look, that momentum of the metaverse, it's been building for a while for the last couple of years. And I'm looking forward personally to working with customers in this space to reimagine new business models, uh, to open up new markets from traditional to more contemporary and to continue building our own internal capability at EY. It's gonna be a really um, exciting period for us. So now we're gonna switch from the metaverse towards something that is globally present, environment, social responsibility and governance, ESG. Its global importance is accelerating organizational alignment towards sustainability. And for many enterprise organizations, ESG is now part of their core DNA, uh, building on their existing value proposition and adding value. And for some, value can be formed through a number of different ways in looking at ESG. First could be cost reduction uh, in energy consumption and waste management. It could be uh, the motivation of employees through credible diversity inclusion. And of course that attracts new talent. In addition to that, financial support from government interventions um, in terms of release and subsidies. Uh, asset optimization is another one so that you can look at strong digital traceability. And then finally, looking at investing in a different way. So that means assessing what you're investing in and looking if it has some type of long-term environmental improvement or social responsibility. So those are the key things where value can be added. All of this, of course, is based on the digital future and that can be enabled by blockchain. In our region, in Asia Pacific, our move has essentially been measured and balanced. So let me give you some examples. In Australia, the federal government committed to a net zero carbon emission pathway to 2050. Uh, which is, will go pretty quickly. Uh, in last year's federal budget, half a billion dollars was allocated to enhancing biosecurity and $1.6 billion was allocated to clean energy technology. Um, along with that, a massive commitment to keep reducing energy prices for the consumption of energy for consumers. Managing carbon emissions and credits. Well, that's gonna be really a key focus, I feel. Uh, we'll have to have stronger accounting. And again, blockchain is really front and center for this in terms of tokenization solutions and, and providing integrity so that it can solve that sort of accounting challenge. In Japan, the commitment is similar with carbon neutrality goal as well for 2050. So that aligns pretty closely with many Japanese organizations also feeling socially responsible and looking at their investments as well. So that's quite key in terms of scrutinizing financial investments. 
In Singapore, public listed companies have been required to publish annual sustainability reports since 2016. So that's been some time. There's been government intervention as well that supported that pathway and the introduction of carbon taxes, which has been $25 per tonne for greenhouse emissions. And that's moving towards, gonna to be moving towards in the future to 2030 to $80 per tonne. As you can see, there is a strong push behind it by the government to actually get companies to do more. I think that's enough business context for me. What I'd really like to do now is, is introduce you to the panel today. I'm really grateful to have the chairman and co-founder of uh, PowerLeader, Dr. Gemma Green. I also have Emma Weston, CEO and co-founder of AgriDigital. And also have Dr. Dane Etheridge from Curtin University, who is also the CFO of Impact C. So at this point, I think it'd be great to talk about the energy sector and maybe Gemma, if you don't mind, just giving a bit of an overview of how uh, the adoption has taken place with ESG and maybe a little bit around how blockchain has been part of that as an enabler. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me, EY. Um, I think in terms of um, ESG adoption, you know, there's you know, obviously been decades worth of work now around issues around climate change and um, you know, global um, policies and accords and protocols. Um, but I, I'd say that um, just observationally, what's happened in Europe uh, you know, in the past a few weeks has really propelled energy policy forward, like I would say five years in a matter of a couple of weeks. And uh, in terms of like the energy story as a part of the ESG piece really focused on the E, I think that, you know, fossil fuels have been um, demonised to an extent that has made them very unpopular to kind of develop any new projects, even if they're, they're needed. Like politicians haven't wanted to open up a, you know, a gas fired power station. And um, I think, um, you know, petroleum producers have been demonized for making big profits, but without them, they don't develop new projects. And I think the energy story, you know, energy is not like cocoa beans. It's far more complex than, um, you know, than other commodities. You can't just store it readily. And we've collapsed concepts around like variable renewable energy and dispatchable renewable energy and set targets around like, you know, renewable hundred companies can be a hundred percent renewable, but the way that they go about doing that doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually procuring uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, matched against their energy load profile. They could be buying certificates from different times of the year or different places. And so um, I think we've had almost like a perfect storm occur where um, the utilization of a lot of um, generation assets, energy generation assets has come down such that it's no longer viable for them to operate, but without um, adequate replacement supply and, uh, you know, and a stronger demand triggered by a lot of the money printing and stimulus packages in the past two years from COVID. And um, this situation has, you know, led to an energy crisis globally. Uh, you know, it, it's been brewing for some time, um, but it's certainly been made, you know, extraordinarily more pronounced, you know, in the past month or so. And, um, you know, we've seen Germany announce that it's going to go to 100% renewable energy and it's currently sitting at 53%. And if it does, you know, the next 47%, the way it's done the 53%, it's going to have, you know, it already has the highest electricity costs in the world. And, um, the reason is because it's done renewables in a very centralised way. And, you know, the centralised planning has led to large generation in the north of the country, whilst the consumption's in the south. So large spend on network as well as grid stabilisation services. And so the levelised cost of electricity doesn't really tell the full story. And I, I think now we're starting to see the backlash occur from the, 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 the squeeze in terms of availability where... Um, you know, there is talk about extending the life of a nuclear power plants that would otherwise have been retired soon and, um, you know, coal and gas fired, coal fired power stations will have their um, lives 
lifespans extent, extended as well um, to ease the supply pressure. So uh, I think that in terms of how we do renewables from 0% to 50% um, is very different to how we will need to do it to get from 50 to 100% because it's gonna be very focused on differential power and dispatchable power. And that means that you need energy that is time-based and place-based. So I think time and place are gonna become very important concepts in terms of energy. And autonomy is also gonna be a very, very strong theme inside of getting to this net zero target, whether it be net zero 20, 30, 40, or 50. So I think in terms of um, like the ES, in terms of the work that we're doing at Powerledge and what we observe in energy markets, in some places like Europe, you've had like a um, clean energy package directive from 2018, which was foreshadowed, you know, for years prior to that, um, which will allow the creation of clo close proximity trading of energy, energy communities. So for example, a school can supply electricity to mums and dads and the mums and dads can share energy with each other. And the shorter the distance the electricity travels before it's consumed, the lesser the network charge. So this is something that's been planned, you know, foreshadowed for some time. Whereas in India, we did a project in the state of Uttar Pradesh um, uh, last year, and that was a small demonstration project that led to a decree um, allowing peer-to-peer -peer trading powered by the blockchain across the state, which is the largest and most popular state in India. It has 225 million people there. Um, and so you can see that not all, like sometimes leapfrogging is going to, get you, you know, fast, fast, further forward than perhaps, you know, plan, long term planning that we see in the European market and even in the US market with um, like a, a FERC um, order of um, uh, FERC 2222, which was announced in September 2020. And that allows um, anyone with distributed energy resources to participate in wholesale electricity markets. So I think if you just look at the global landscape, you know, these mega trends around, you know, decarbonisation have been around for some time, but I think the, the emphasis on the urgency around um, addressing the supply crunch that we currently have, will see a lot more innovation, you know, um, than, than, you know than, than we probably saw in the last five years, the impetus and the need to, to act more quickly now, you know, and to address things around, you know, people having to choose between eating and heating, um, I think it, it's, you know, it's never been more serious than an issue, I would say. And then in terms of the blockchain layer over the top of that, you know, people ask, why do you need a blockchain? And my answer is you don't. Um, in the same way, you can have a supermarket, like in the topic, in the context of energy, you can have a supermarket without barcodes. And it's not like any one of us here would go to a supermarket because of the barcodes. You know, you just never say, oh, I'm going to this supermarket because it has barcodes, no. Um, but that supermarket that does have barcodes has good stock control. And when you go through the till, it's seamless and there's no mistakes. And the same with energy with blockchain, it sits in the back, it creates, um, you know, an immutable record that is trustworthy. And that's important in creating these new markets and it can do more complex transactions efficiently when you start to, turn on things like smart contracting functionality and reduce the need for intermediaries. So you can do almost, if not all of it without a blockchain and having a blockchain there makes the system operate in a more efficient way and a more trustworthy way akin to how you would um, with a supermarket with barcodes versus a supermarket without. So yeah, they're just some high level comments uh, on ESG and, and blockchain. Thanks, Gemma. Yeah, I agree with what's happening over in Europe at the moment. It's been, there's going to be a lot of fast pace uh, to support that situation. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how the chat we work towards those challenges. Emma, in terms of agriculture uh, with your organisation, organization, AgriDigital, and where you think um, mass adoption is occurring with, within agriculture, What's, what's your view in terms of uh, that adoption? Yeah, sure, thanks. And such a lovely, um, yeah, such a lovely opportunity to be here and share um, alongside Gemma and Dane as well. Um, so three industries that I think um, present um, both 
challenges and opportunities. Um, and I'm not going to um, kind of labor the point with what Gemma expressed so well in the energy sector, except to say that um, agriculture is actually very similar to energy in some ways where um, you know, we are effectively part of the problem and part of the solution and a very, very central part of both. And so, um, you know, there are detractors and there are opportunists and there are, you know, and there is everyone in between in the space. Um, and in some ways, uh, without diving straight into blockchain, but blockchain, crypto based technologies and opportunities um, have only emphasized that um, in some ways. But if we just take a step back and think about progressive investment and ESG capability within the agricultural sector, you know, the way I think about progressive investment is the, you know, the, the way or, or an opportunity to invest, um, you know, in a way that uh, does good without compromising um, on investment returns. And, you know, this is quite squarely where we're seeing opportunity in the agricultural sector and take up in the agricultural sector, because what we have is an, an, is an industry that has been heavily commoditized um, to the point where there are uneven, um, unbalanced, and in fact, um, terminal you know returns um, for certain participants and so you know when we think about um, you know what progressive or ESG based investments might look like in agriculture it's starting to rethink the way in which we construct supply chains the position of the participants so the farmer as a operator within a supply chain not just a producer and a price taker um, and you know these are these are these are opportunities, but they're also unknowns because we have not been in that world for well over a hundred years. And so you know this uh, this is somewhat scary for some. So I think um, in terms of at a at a, at a high level. Um, I think it was uh, SMP Global Market Intelligence that reported recently that um, the research on industrialized farming shows that the environmental impact on a per annum basis is three trillion dollars a year. So the opportunity to have a look at um, agriculture, and this is not just farming, this is a broader view of agriculture, which encompasses supply chain and all the way through to consumer based technologies as well. Um, it is very, very real, it is very proximate. And let me put it another way, the same report, that's all we could share with participants later on, um, estimated that the production of corn uh, or the impact, sorry, and caused by the production of corn, the environment, environmental impact is 170% the value of the production. So we are literally, um, <laughs> we, we are literally growing stuff um, and destroying at the same time. And this is the conundrum that agriculture presents. So when I think about agriculture in the context of blockchain, I really think about three main use cases or three buckets. And this is what we look at from an agri-digital perspective. Um, and we work in the grain supply chain. So I certainly can't speak for all of agriculture, just for everyone that's listening. I am not an agricultural specialist. I uh, definitely know grain supply chains very well though. Um, but from a grain supply chain, and I think it does apply to the broader, um, the, the broader agricultural industry and perhaps, you know, broader than that into other industries as well, there are three main, you know, opportunities that blockchain presents and that's transaction and payment security. So once again, as Gemma said, you're not, I loved that analogy, by the way, Gemma, of not going to the supermarket for the barcode, but boy, don't we love the impact that those barcodes have had on, you know, our productivity, our ability to have a great customer experience, our trust that we place in the products that we buy and so forth. Well, transaction and payment security, that's, you know, that's the barcode piece, right? Um, but there is also network and market efficiency also um, you know, part of that barcode example, that's the second bucket that we really look at. And when you're looking at um, both energy finance and agriculture, we're talking about industries with multiple players of diverse backgrounds um, and, you know, complex systems. And in the case of agriculture and, and also energy and finance to, um, you know, a different type of degree, um, mostly dominated by cross-border trade as well. So jurisdictional complexity as well. Um, and so the third, so anything that looks at um, network and market efficiency um, is, is going to be really important. And the third bucket is the one that people most like to concentrate on, but I, so I deliberately put it third just to be provocative, um, and that is provenance and chain assurance. So we all like to jump to traceability and knowing where our food comes from, but I would argue that is the lesser of the problems um, to solve for when it comes to how ESG can have a 
positive impact and progressive investment can have a positive impact on agriculture and the way that we are going to generate returns in the future. Yeah, great. I, I agree with you. I think um, traceability, provenance, that's definitely the first thing that everyone jumps to in terms of you know, looking at how your supply chain is tracking. So thanks for that. Dane, financial sustainability and what it is becoming increasingly important for organisations now to, to be transparent. Um, I'd, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on where you think uh, organisations are going with financial sustainability and where the momentum's going in this space. Yeah, absolutely, Rick. As you pointed out, you know, at the outset of this session, there's heaps of progress happening in the in the real economy, if you will, towards ESG improvements. You know, stakeholder expectations are, um, if anything, accelerating um, in this respect, and uh, targets like net zero and, and other ESG targets that we've already discussed are becoming very normalised and embedded in in almost business as usual. So these trends aren't going anywhere, um, and given that. Obviously, it's no surprise then that the financial markets have seen an opportunity. This is this is what the financial markets do, after all. Um, and the hundreds of people you've attracted to this session, Rick, suggests that they're not the only ones seeing an opportunity. Um, so to put it into perspective, uh, for those who, who don't live this sort of day to day, this year we're probably going to see a trillion dollars or thereabouts, trillion US dollars invested into green bonds alone. Okay, so obviously bonds are just one subset of the financial universe and bonds really just address the E in ESG. So that's a slither, albeit a very important slither. Bloomberg um, and Morgan Stanley uh, and, and, and likely others, but the, the, at least those two are forecasting a $50 trillion ESG finance market by 2025. So who knows what will end up, but it's clear that there's a lot of growth to come. And that growth, I think, is where the blockchain opportunity really comes in. Because as with anything in financial markets, we see when something grows rapidly, risks and nefarious actors and, and, and systemic issues get embedded. Um, and blockchain promises to mitigate some of those risks. You know, just a couple conscious of time, we've got things like greenwashing or you know, increasingly more generally ESG washing. This is front of everybody's mind and investors are getting really sophisticated. They're getting quite specific about the kind of stuff that they um, are targeting um, and their expectations are increasing. Um, similarly, the companies um, themselves operating in various supply chains, they're really concerned about getting left with an environmental black eye. You know, um, So if the market doesn't improve the consistency and accountability of reporting, this will, this will hinder its growth. Uh, you know, consistency is happening and improving outside of the blockchain space. Uh, standards like the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, EU legislation, probably we'll see SEC legislation in the next 12 months to two years around how they have to report um, climate and ESG related risks. Um, so this, this, is, this is a positive move, right? But from the company's perspective, this is gonna increase regulatory and litigation risk which is going to add further pressure uh, or, or incentives to really get truth and transparency into their, into their reporting. Uh, so the kind of use cases that Emma just mentioned with AgriDigital, I think uh, just as, as one example um, of, of sort of tracking supply chains, we're going to see a lot of innovation in that space. It's not without challenges, of course, though, Rick. Um, obviously, blockchain uh, doesn't and, and, and other other sort of ledger technologies do not remove the need for due diligence in the real world. For example, you know, mentioned carbon credits at the outset, they still need to be assessed. Um, so sometimes the claims can maybe be a little bit hyperbolic, although increasingly the incorporation of other technology like spatial assets, um, maybe people smarter than me will find ways to incorporate them together. Um, and of course, if we're using blockchain for ESG reporting and, and, and tracing, then we can expect more pressure um, to move to less energy intensive consensus mechanisms. Um, you know, it's not enough to say that cryptos consume less energy than gold or traditional banks when it's apparent that crypto is still so small in comparison. Now, obviously, from what you've heard, Gemma is much closer to that space than I am. So I'll probably park it there and, and, uh, and open that conversation up for later. Um, We've also got, of course, um, much more than the E. 
and, and the E and the ESG. And this is something that I think is particularly um, interesting for blockchain because that verification, that traceability um, is often more difficult in the S and G elements. You know, um, like Emma mentioned, it's not all just sort of, oh, so like Gemma mentioned, it's not all just like soybeans. So on S, just briefly, you know, things like financial inclusion, allowing for greater access to the financial markets. In G, the governance space, you know, we can talk about shareholder engagement, um, tracing legitimate voting through in corporations as well as as well as governments. Um, and of course, it's going to help companies comply, just comply, even if they don't care about entering the sustainable market space, the sustainable finance space at all. Um, they're going to be affected by it. Things like the Modern Slavery Act, you know, force companies really to have greater awareness of their supply chains. And in you know, the country that the, the, the panellists of this particular session are, are reporting from, Australia, more than a third of the largest companies, the ones subject to this act, aren't complying. So clearly, there needs a lot of work here. Um, similarly with business to business, right? At the moment, an important company downstream in the value chain requires evidence of ESG process, this just pushes further upstream. So this is going to just drive further demand for truth and transparency. Um, to the extent that the DeFi people are right and we move increasingly to smart uh, smart contracts and of course blockchain is going to become even more important. So basically, I think it's an exciting time ahead. Exactly what these solutions look like, who knows? That's for the people probably on this call. Um, but there's no doubt that there's a big opportunity there and it's growing. Um, and it's going to be increasingly business as usual. Thanks, Dane. That's brilliant. I think you summed it up nicely. I think what I've taken from this from all three of you talking today is, I guess there's a network effect that can be drawn here where uh, if you do use blockchain, you can, you can use it in two different ways. One is to solve a specific isolated problem. However, the biggest opportunity here is that network effect, which is, um, allowing that to be available across industry, across uh, participants, so that everyone can get involved, everyone can see what that transparency is, everyone can trust the data that is available across all those three areas. So that being said, um, we are getting close to, uh, to time. Unfortunately, we've run really, really close to time. But uh, I think we can do a few questions. So I've got a couple of questions here that... Um, I'll just pose up. So the first one is a bit of a, a myth buster, which I get all the time. So I'm going to give this one to Gemma if that's okay. And it's around energy consumption. And the, the common trade around this is why, why is there so much energy consumption with Bitcoin? What, and they associate it with blockchain as well. Um, do you want to have a go at answering that, Gemma? Sure. Uh, well, there are different types of blockchains and some actually are very energy in intensive, uh, unintensive. I'm not sure, quite sure of the correct parlance, but um, blockchain, Bitcoin is one of the energy hungry uh, blockchains. And that's because it uses um, a proof of work um, consensus mechanism, which basically means there's a very complex mathematical problem that needs to be solved to mint a Bitcoin. And once that problem is solved, the next problem is more complex and and also more energy hungry. Um, and so the, the, the Bitcoin um, network has, all, has erroneously become like um, synonymous with all blockchains, but it's not in fact the case that all of them are energy hungry. So you can have proof of stake blockchains, proof of authority blockchains, and they can be very low energy. So we actually have moved, Power Ledger has moved from an Ethereum-based blockchain um, to record electricity transactions to a Solana-based blockchain to record energy transactions. So we've done um, a, a clone of the code. We haven't done a data fork. So the um, Power Ledger energy blockchain isn't attached to the Solana blockchain, nor was it attached to the Ethereum one. And that Solana blockchain is super, super energy efficient and also operates on renewable energy and there's quite a lot of examples of you know blockchains that are um, run on you know proof of authority or proof of um, uh, proof of stake consensus mechanisms that are not energy um, intensive but I think that the attention on Bitcoin has been quite interesting and you've seen um, you know uh, Tesla for example 
saying they would accept payment for Tesla cars using Bitcoin, but then Elon Musk said, no, uh, the Bitcoin needs to be at least 50% renewable energy um, yeah. derived in the production of the Bitcoin for him to be able to do that. So it's been quite, I think it's been interesting to see that, you know, that discourse take place. But um, I would say most of the, the blockchain solutions don't suffer from the, um, the, the energy extremes of Bitcoin. Perfect answer. I couldn't have said that better myself. Okay, so we've actually run out of time. I'm, 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 unfortunately, we've come right to the end of it. So I'm going to have to pause on all these other questions. But I just want to thank the panellists today. Uh, thank you so much for being involved. And I'm going to hand over now to Scott, Scott Waller. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rick. Hopefully I'm audible and you can all hear me okay. Um, that was a fantastic session. Re really enjoyed that. And, and again, echo uh, Rick's, Rick's thoughts there around um, thanking the panellists. Uh, I, I think, you know, we can all agree there's no bigger challenge as, as a world, as a society that we're facing today um, than these ESG topics. My name is Scott Waller and super excited to be talking to you today, really continuing the theme that you just heard around ESG, which obviously touches very heavily on, on supply chains. I'm going to be talking a bit more generically about supply chains and traceability, uh, and we'll also touch on, on ESG again. Um, I'm going to start with just a quick recap around why blockchains, although the, the last panel has done a great job of explaining why. Uh, we're then going to have a look at a, a case study of a project we did with a client in Australia around, uh, uh, around food recall management and how blockchains can be used in that space. I will then hand over to my colleague uh, Federico De Poli, who's, who's going to actually show you how to create tokens. So for those of you who perhaps this is a bit uh, nefarious, you don't understand what a token is, how do you actually create it, is it hard? Stay tuned for that session. I can guarantee that it's going to be super interesting you get to see tokens created in, in real time. And then I'm going to wrap up with four key ESG use cases, uh, continuing the theme of the last panel where blockchain can, can fundamentally improve uh, on current practices. Next slide. So we now know through what we see uh, with, uh, with, with DeFi uh, and the crypto ecosystem. Next slide, please that uh, blockchains have really proven themselves when it comes to delivering implicit trust between parties who are exchanging information. So through those decentralized finance protocols um, that, that are now used with, with massive amounts of liquidity, we can see that analog current day finance processes just can't compete with the efficiency of these systems. And perhaps counterintuitively for some, uh, compared with the mainstream um, narrative, we also know blockchains are inherently more transparent and auditable because they cannot be changed and, and parties have true data lineage uh, across the origination. And these properties create a very compelling set of attributes when we, when we start to look at some of the problems in today's supply chains. Next slide. So over the past three years, EY has focused very heavily uh, on building industry solutions on top of what we call our ops chain product. And we're gonna be talking about the uh, traceability product today. That's what Federico is, is going to demonstrate. Um, and, and our goal with this is really to create a, a managed service to allow clients to create tokens and start quickly and easily sharing data and not just sharing data, but also transferring value across supply chains, which is gonna to lead to more trust and, and better quality data to execute business transactions. So this is, this is an extremely powerful concept. Um, when you consider something like ESG that we've just been talking about, which spans many organization boundaries, you may be able to report on scope one and possibly scope two emissions, but when it comes to scope three, it, it's nigh on impossible. Um, and so our, our goal with something like EY Ops Chain traceability is to enable scope one, two, and three to be tracked through a token on a blockchain that consumers and shareholders can have that full transparency over the data lineage because it's shared across all parties uh, and the protocol and the platform is not owned by any one party. So all can contribute. Next slide. So Let's, firstly, let's start with a bit more of an operationally focused use case that EY has performed with a dairy manufacturer in Australia and a major retailer. Uh, next slide. 
And this project focused on helping to solve some critical challenges across food supply chain. And you know, I would argue that there's none more bigger in the food space than food waste. Um, food waste is, is enormous. It's one of the top five contributors to, to carbon emissions globally. Um, and to put that in context in, the, in Australia, uh, it does some 7.3 million tonnes of food each year, which is wasted, which equates to $20 billion. So this, this, is, this is huge. So in this project, what we looked at was how blockchain can help reduce the operational costs and commercial operations that are currently difficult to coordinate in, in a food recall event. So as you can imagine, in a food recall, it's not just coordinating your own activities as, as a retailer or a manufacturer, but it's working across your, your warehousing, your distributors, your third party logistics companies to give confidence to the regulator you've recovered all the contaminated goods. Next slide. So what we looked at uh, in this one was really using three components to the solution. And uh, the panel has referred to, to many of these uh, attributes um, in describing the, um, the ESG challenge. Uh, and so let, let's just step through um, what, what each of these provides. So, so firstly, tokens. This is a mechanism that's used to create a digital twin on a blockchain of the physical good in the supply chain. So that can be a cart of milk, it can be a pallet of milk, it could be raw, raw materials. Um, and what we do with those tokens is we link them together in a parent-child relationship. So anywhere in the supply chain up and down, I, I know the um, upstream or downstream uh, related uh, products as it goes through its transformation in the supply chain. Smart contracts. So the smart contracts are, are really the business rules layer. So this, this is where um, if in a recall event, there are certain claims procedures that need to be carried out and there's certain rules and penalties around that. They're contained in a smart contract and they're visible to all parties. Uh, so all parties agree to those rules and then the rules cannot be changed. So this has a massive benefit when it comes to reconciliations and accruals because everyone has the same data points. And then lastly, uh, we, we need analytics. We need to analyze that. So this is all about trusted data so far and then we need to turn that into insight and action. And so what we did is built a, a business intelligence layer. Next slide. So first off, uh, the, the first use case we looked at was focusing on helping the client with creating a single source of truth on the production location, the volumes and the state of the supply chain. So in a food recall event, this is absolutely critical that a company knows where the goods are, who's got what, so that they can quarantine it. So the first step we looked at was uh, on the initiation of a recall using a batch ID from the manufacturer supplied through a web form, which we can then determine all the downstream and upstream products and where they actually sit uh, across logistics partners and warehouses. Once a recall event is formalized in the supply chain, the affected product tokens are identified uh, and they can be taken out and put into a recall wallet, uh, effectively taking them out of circulation. And this is all uh, done in an easy to use web portal. So all parties can see what's happening. Next slide. The second process flow we looked at was one more uh, of an operational one around actual stock recovery. So physically quarantining the product. Um, and the current process with the client lacked the ability to centrally track when goods were taken off the shelf across potentially hundreds of stores and warehouses. And so what we did here was provide a single dashboard where all parties um, across the supply chain could enter the, the quarantining events and everyone saw the status of that. Next slide. So when we pull all this together, what we're able to see is a radically different way of working from today's world. Uh, let's just step through this where, where we've ended up. So on entering a batch ID, once a production run has been determined, to be contaminated, the distributors and retailers upstream and downstream are notified and the raw materials providers receive an alert in case there's any uh, upstream, uh, upstream issues. On receiving the recall event, the upstream parties are able to see all the affected stock, which they're then in custody of. And then a flag is set on the digital twin to halt any further movements of that product. If the consumers have purchased contaminated product, they can also be alerted through loyalty applications. Lastly, we now have a trusted shared data source where all commercial processes can be driven off of for reordering. So ne next slide, please. So that leads me to introducing you to Federico Di Poli, who's the product owner for EY's Ops Chain Traceability product, 
And he's now going to show you just how to do this uh, in action. Thanks, Federico. So thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Federico De Poli. I'm a global product owner of Upstream Traceability at EY, and I'm also a technical lead for blockchain on EMEA. And what I'm going to do today is walk you through Upstream Traceability, which is actually a suite of products which we have built into our software as a service portfolio, which enables to provide supporting capabilities to start doing what Scott was just mentioning about ESG and sustainability. So when we talk about upstream traceability, we talk about a business application, which we have built to track information and create digital assets. And those digital assets can be traded by using a blockchain and the information attached to it can be leveraged by business process so they can have real time visibility and see the information that they need. The goal of upstream traceability products is to actually provide traceability and transparency and at the end of the day, give company leverage on operational performances, uh, on creating new business revenue models, and at the end of the day, also improving their brand perception and the brand equity. So upstream traceability is core uh, for building out ESG and sustainability use case because it provides all the information and all the capabilities we need to have transparency and trust on our products. Uh, upstream traceability is built on different concepts. Uh, we all started with notarization, which was what we had more or less four years ago. And notarization is, of course, a very simple but effective way to record information on a blockchain and put it there forever. So let's assume that I want to track a certain certificate of quality or any document which is attached with my product. I can put a fingerprint on the blockchain by putting a hash and this hash is going to prove me the authenticity of the information until that information is changed. So if I want to compare at any time a document I have received, I can just cross check on the blockchain. I have a bulletproof uh, transaction which shows me which is what's the hash at the time and I can use it to prove that the document has not been changed and therefore the information is genuine. Notarization was not enough and also was not allowing us to create digital assets. And what we did was starting to embrace tokenization and tokens. With tokens, we can create those digital assets which represents physical goods most of the time. And those tokens can be of different types. They can be fungible, they can be semi-fungible, and they can be non-fungible. So when we talk about fungible tokens, we talk about something which has the same value item by item. That means that if I buy one a fungible token or I buy another one, the tokens will have the same value, they will not have a different value. This is described on Ethereum by the ERC20 standard, and this is what we have implemented into our tokenization capabilities to provide fungible tokens. Then we have built on top of non-fungible tokens, which you might have heard lately because it's a rising trend uh, for art, for example, for music and so on. Non-fungible tokens are described by ERC721, and basically what they do is create a unique asset which can be traded on the blockchain for a specific value defined by the user, and therefore they can have different values, different uh, life cycles, and they are all unique. Those non-fungible tokens are very helpful when we talk about uh, tracking information, tracking supply chain and value chains, because they can be used to carry information related to the production process. Semi-fungible tokens, which we are building out into our upstream product and are going to be available soon, uh, mix the two words that we just mentioned. So fungibility and non-fungibility. Those are combined into your C1155 standard, which allows us to enable new use cases. For example, if I produce something in batches and then I have to I create, for example, bottles of something like beer, uh, those things are going to be tracked by a semi-fungible token at the batch level. It's going to have a certain ID. It's going to carry the information of production. And then the single bottles will be fungible tokens related to the same non-fungible batch. So that is an enabler that let us build, together with notarization, a couple of business applications that we have, which is uh, value chain traceability, which we started doing with notarization, we transition it to tokens because we believe that tokens are going to be the game changer for traceability. 
This one, we're going to see it in a demo, allows to track and trace value chains from the items to the step and the data that we want to collect. It allows to work collaboratively with business partners and therefore allows to create an ecosystem that can scale. On the other side, with the tokens, we were able to create asset inventory management, which is another significant use case, especially if we want to prove our value chain, the sustainability of our value chain in terms of transportation, distribution, or if we want to get some operational benefits from inventory management, we can use tokens which represents the physical assets, move them in real time across the different uh, actors which are receiving those goods, and have real-time inventory, real-time visibility, and at the end of the day, reduce disputes, reduce frauds, reduce lost goods, and have a strong benefit on our supply chain operations. Upstream traceability has been built as part of our blockchainui.com uh, software as a service portfolio. So the good news for our customers is that you don't have to care about anything else than just running your use case on our software. What you can do is either use our user interface or you can integrate through our APIs and send your data into the systems and we will take care of the rest. That means that we take care about the infrastructure, we take care about all the connectors that you need to work with the blockchain, and we also take care about the integration with the blockchain, which of course is for us public, so Ethereum and Polygon, Ethereum-based blockchains. Uh, but we can also eventually provide some custom integration with a private blockchain if that is needed. And this is making option traceability very flexible because it adapts to the context where this is installed. So let me just switch to a quick demo. So now we are inside ops chain and this is uh, our landing page. We're going to start with traceability, uh, which is our application we were talking about. So on traceability, what we can do is creating our value chain. So we can start and say, we are going to create a sustainable t-shirt uh, value chain, which is going to describe our use case. And as you can see now, what we can do is define the items that we want to trace. We will be able to add some steps. We will be able to add permissions, define the metadata you want to track, and then we will be able to finalize. So let's go through it, make it simple. We're going to start with cotton, which is our raw material. Let us set up a smart contract, which is going to create a uh, non-fungible token smart contract. <clears throat> I'm going to start the deployment. As you see now, it's ongoing and it's going to hit the blockchain. In the meantime, we can continue. <clears throat> I'm going to have cotton sheets, for example, which is going to be dependent uh, from the work in progress. Sorry, it's going to be a work in progress and it's going to depend on the cotton. And we will set up a smart contract also for the uh, cotton sheets. And then what we're going to do is we will do the same stuff for the final product, which is our T-shirt. And this T-shirt is going to be our final good. It's going to depend on the cotton sheet. So now let's finalize just the deployment of that. So you can see I'm doing that live. And it's very, uh, very, very simple operation to do. So now we are deploying our second smart contract which is going to cover the cotton sheets token. So every batch of cotton sheets is going to have a token inside that smart contract. And when that is done, <clears throat> we will be able also to set up one more smart contract for our t-shirt, which is going to wrap up uh, the, items the items part. So this is very important because by creating a smart contract, we are adding tokens. Of course, it's taking a while because we are, even if we're eating a test net, it's still taking some time. And we're going to start also creating the T-shirt. As you can see, it has, it has finished right now. So we are creating our final smart contract, uh, which is the T-shirt. As you can see now, cotton sheets and cotton has been assigned properly. And we are pretty close to be able to finish that part. And this is where really we are starting to hit the blockchain. So it's tokenizing our goods. All right, we're ready to move on. We can continue. Now the next phase is defining our steps of the value chain. So in this phase, what we will be able to do is defining exactly our value chain, which are the steps uh, of that value chain. So let's kick start that. And let's start from the production of the cotton, uh, which is going to be our first step. We're going to tokenize. That means that we will create 
a token for cotton uh, as soon as we start. Then we're going to have a packing phase for the cotton. Uh, so we can just name it cotton packing. And it's still going to involve the cotton as well. The next step is going to be uh, the uh, weaving of the cotton, uh, which produces the cotton sheets. And this is going to be our next step. We're going to have cotton sheets packing as well. So cotton sheets involved here. And then we will finish with our final product, the t-shirt. And we're going to have the assembling of the t-shirt, which is going to start from cotton sheets. And we will have also one more, which is the t-shirt packing. So at this phase, we have described our value chain. As you can see, it's quite articulated. And we are creating tokens in three of these steps. Next phase is to define if we have any business partner. Uh, so in this case, we are skipping that because I don't have any business partners added to my organization. But if you have business partners, you will be able to assign them, give them a role in each step so they can contribute and create tokens or update the metadata of the token based on the role. So we'll continue. The next phase is the metadata part. I'm going to make it simple and just add a few of them. So for example, we're going to put a location for production for the cotton. That data is going to be unrestricted. We want everybody to see it so we can prove the sustainability of our stuff. And it sits with the production. And then we're going to have another date, which is uh, the weight of the package of cotton, which is going to be a measurement type. It's going to be kilograms. It's going to be still unrestricted. We want to give transparency, immutable, so we cannot change it. And it's going to involve the cotton packing. Keep in mind, we can track also mutable data if we want. For example, if we have data coming from sensors that we need to continuously refresh, we don't want users to continue doing transactions. So we are using that immutable and mutable data to discriminate whether it's needed to do a blockchain transaction or not. So I made it simple uh, just for cotton. What I could have done, and I'm doing that right now, I can always go back and edit what I did. So I can carry on and do something for the cotton sheets. I'm going to make it simple again. So on the weaving, what I'm going to do is going to be tracking the weaving date, for example, which is going to be a free text type, unrestricted again, and still immutable. And what I want to do is also define the number of sheets produced for that batch <clears throat> into the packing phase. So that is going to be, again, uh, a sort of a measurement, but we will go pick a free text so we want to add some more stuff. And we're going to make it immutable. For t-shirt instead, what we're going to do is define the production site. So for example, I'm going to put it again, location, unrestricted, immutable. We we'll assign it to the assembling. And then we have the number of t-shirts in each pack which is going to be, again, a measure, and it's going to refer to the t-shirt packing. And then we can continue. And now we are pretty much ready to start creating our value chain. So this is a recap. So you can see everything that we configured. It's here. And then we can submit. And this is going to activate our value chain. So now you can see we have a nice button, which is data gathering portal. And clicking on data gathering, what I can do is start ingesting the data for each step. So for example, here, I want to create my first batch of cotton, uh, which is going to have a certain ID. I want to assign it a certain position. Let's assume warehouse. You can use the helper here, but I'm going to use just coordinates to make it easy. So this is nearby where I am right now. And what I can do now is start and register that on the blockchain. So what I'm going to do is trigger a transaction, which is going to put some token into the blockchain, is going to add the metadata to it. And when that is done, we will be able to move on into the cotton packing, and we will be able to start editing that. So as soon as we have the transaction completed, we will be able to fetch the data and continue adding information. So as you can see now, we can add the, the weight of the package which is the metadata we have defined for the second step. So for example, we're going to have 1,000 kilograms. And we can, again, register that information and go on the blockchain and say, OK, I want to register that. And I have sent it out. I can move on into the weaving. Here we can define the weaving batch, which might be a different ID. 
And we can track dependencies, one or many batches of, talk of cotton. So if we have a composed product coming from different batches, we can track that. And what we can put here is a date. So for example, I can put the date, uh, I don't know, the 14th of March, and I can submit my transaction again. And I can do pretty much that for all the steps that I have. And I can always go and check all the data that I have recorded into the registered data tab. As you can see here, we have the two different transactions involving the cotton, and then we have the cotton sheet, which is still pending. So the pending transaction is not visible. It's still going on. The register data for step cotton packing instead is done, and we can head to the Explorer and see that transaction and check when it's happened. It was 57 seconds ago, and it was an update of the metadata because that was involving a token that I have already created. And as you can see, we are referring to the data which we are serving through our upstream. So you can go there and check that the hash of the data matches with what is on the blockchain. And this is pretty much the traceability app, which as you might expect is strictly connected to tokens. On the token side, if we go there, we will just be able to see exactly the same smart contracts we did deploy. So cotton, cotton sheets and t-shirts. And if we jump in, we can see the token that we have created, the one, two, three, four, five. And we can see exactly all the information that was recorded. So the coordinates and the weight. So we have those inter interdependencies between traceability and tokens, which are helpful to work on different sides. So I can use that tokens to do inventory management. I can use that token to prove sustainability of my products. And I can always move those tokens into my business partners at any time. So that was it for today. And thank you and back to you, Scott. Thanks, Federico. Um, look, as you can see, the EY Ops Chain product is quite rich in features. Uh, we, we have that product available so that can be used as both a platform as a service. So you can actually consume APIs uh, and, and build your own solution if you need to, or you can use the user interface that is there, of which Federico was explaining and taking you through. So I'm going to leave you with a number of use cases. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And we'll talk through what that looks like in terms of what we've been working with customers in and around this space. The first is around green energy certificates. We've been doing a lot of work around this. Um, so this is about using the tokenization model that we talked about earlier in our food recall example uh, to track the output of carbon offset projects. Um, by tokenizing offsets, companies are able to create fungible offset and then they can be listed in the marketplace that has full lineage from its origin to its actual use. This is not only provides greater trust and transparency to those purchasing the offset, but it also helps and goes beyond the trading perspective. The second is around carbon emissions and reporting. In a similar way of which offsets uh, are tokenized, emissions can be tokenized as well to provide a basis for purchasing offsets or carbon certificates. This way, emission tokens can be linked with data lineage to companies' output of carbon as well. You can also include um, data from IoT sensors and other trusted data sources to enable the tra transparency to manage and see what their current debt and credits are to reach net zero. So quite operational in that manner. The third is funding models. What is clear in society's race to limit the warning of Earth is that we need to deploy massive amounts of capital quickly and to build, rebuild our energy systems. Through open governance and models, we manage to decentralize autonomous organizations, uh, of which is called decentralized DAOs, and in effect, crowdfund them to be provided as part of uh, a solution. And the fourth is around circular economy and waste management. There's two parts where the blockchain can assist. Firstly, incentivizing reuse and repurposing of materials. And secondly, to ensure companies who uh, claim that they were using they are using recycled goods. So at this point, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, I want to thank everyone for listening to the sessions, all of them today, throughout the morning, to the afternoon. We've gone through a great load of content. 
And I'm now going to hand back to Paul Brady, who's going to talk through and wrap up the closing sessions for us. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Uh, again, Paul Brody with you, Global Blockchain Leader at EY. Um, I, uh, I'm really happy I chose to take today's presentation from my hotel room. It's great to go in the office, but you can't get room service to deliver you lunch uh, while you're listening to these great talks. So um, that was really great. Uh, today's session has been amazing. I, I particularly, I mean, I could call out specifically good things from everybody. Uh, I really love the examples that Magna shared about the metaverse. Um, I want to especially uh, shout out to Ifan and Roy for their talk about the China CBDC perspective, because as I talked about at the beginning today, things that are going on in China, it's a different ecosystem. It's the world's largest economy, but um, because crypto and public blockchains are not allowed, it's a fundamentally di different ecosystem there. And that we have so much to learn from how this ecosystem is evolving a little bit differently. There's gonna be great case examples. There's gonna be really good lessons learned. Um, China has, and I was really fortunate the last visit I made to China right before the pandemic, I got to talk to the PBOC, the Ministry of Communications. We got a real kind of vision to all of the things that are taking place in mainland China. And uh, they have a remarkably complete vision for the future of DCEP, for China's uh, kind of blockchain development, it's different than the division than the vision that exists today in the rest of the world. And so uh, it, it's much more comprehensive. Uh, it's much more centralized. Um, but as these ecosystems evolve, we're going to have a lot to learn. Um, Federico, thank you so much for your demo. I am incredibly excited about where the future of supply chain is going. Uh, before we wrap up today, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I want to thank Wasim and the team in Canada for the incredible work that they have done. Um, I was getting a bunch of comments on, on Discord and other places like, man, I love the way you guys have this really polished uh, uh, video uh, transition. They were really complimenting that. Um, secondly, I want to thank Merrick and Lindsay for all the organizational work that they have put together, doing uh, helping get this, this put together uh, from the United States for, for global delivery. Thirdly, I want to remind everybody, and let's put this up on screen one more time, get your proof of attendance protocol, your POAP tokens. POAP does not stand for proof of a Paul, right? So a picture of me, a screenshot of me is proof that I was here. But uh, if you want to get your proof of attendance protocol token, you need to actually uh, uh, take a, uh, get your camera out, look at this, get it. I, I, EY Legal has told me I cannot promise you that these tokens will be worth millions of dollars in the future. Um, so I'm not promising that, uh, but proof of attendance protocol tokens are a fun thing to keep in your wallet. I have a wallet full of mine showing all the different EY events that I've been to. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, Rick, thank you for a lot of your help and leadership here in organizing the discussions. It's been an excellent day today. A couple of important things. First of all, we will have the edited segments of this available for replay. Uh, we will also have uh, the presentations, uh, to the extent that there were presentations, they will be available for download and they will be available at uh, blockchain.ey.com and there'll be a link uh, to the past event histories. And if you registered for the, um, the summit, I, I believe you'll get an email notification about the event itself. And then we've got a, a, up on the page here, we have uh, the key contacts. There's me, the global blockchain leader, uh, Mark and Jimmy here in Singapore, Scott uh, and Rick in uh, Australia, and Adam also here in Singapore. So, uh, and I, I'm not sure we have Roy's information from mainland China, but uh, if you contact one of us, we will put you in touch with him as well. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Wasim or Rick if there's any other comments that I need to make. And if not, uh, I'm going to wish everybody an excellent afternoon or evening, wherever they are in the world. And I just uh, remind yourself, remind all of you, uh, March, I'm sorry, May 17 to 20 in New York City and broadcast on uh, uh, YouTube and through Zoom. We will have our Global Blockchain Summit. Uh, you can stay up to date with us on that if you subscribe to our mailing list. And that's it. Thank you so much. Have a terrific day. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Look, you've summed it up beautifully. Thank you very much as well um, on behalf of everyone else at EY who have been part of this. And we look forward to next year's bigger and better summit of 2023. So thank you very much and good evening.